Can we go ahead and start with roll call, please? Mayor Bagley. Here. Council Member Christensen. Here. Council Member Hidalgo Faring. Here. Council Member Martin. Here. Council Member Peck. Here. Council Member Rodriguez. Here. Council Member Waters. Here. Mayor, you have a quorum. Great. Uh, let's go ahead. And uh, first of all, the chair would like to remind the public, anyone wishing to speak during the first call, public invited to be heard. We'll need to watch the live stream of the meeting and then we'll put instructions, those instructions up right there. And, uh, oops. My screen disappeared. I was reading something. There we go. All right, so you'll need to watch, if you want to speak during first call public invited to be heard, we'll need to, uh, uh, if you want to provide comment, you're going to go ahead and follow the instructions on the screen. You're limited to three minutes. And then uh, we don't have a timer that counts down, so that counts down on the screen, so I'll go ahead and do that. Um, please, as you start, state your name and address for the record, uh, starting the, uh, preceding your comments, please. All right, do we have an approval of the minutes of the May 19th, 2020 regular session? Actually, um, let's do the oh, sorry. Let's do the pledge real quick because that's always such a um, uh, on, on online. It's always such an adventure. So let's see who's going to lead us this time. Mayor Pro Tem, have you led us in the pledge yet? Just when you were absent. Oh, okay. Uh, let's do uh, Councilmember Peck. Oh, Can you good. Start us off. Okay, I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to, the flag to the flag of, flag of the United States, States of America. States of America. States of America. And to and the Republic, to the Republic for which it stands, for which it stands, stands nation, one nation, under God, one nation, uh, visible, God, liberty, liberty and justice, and justice, justice for, all. For, all. for all. That's awesome. That's my favorite part of the WebEx meetings, by the way. All right, let's go ahead. And now do we have an approval of minutes for May 20th, 2020 regular session? I'm going to move approval of the May 19th, 2020 regular session minutes. Second. I'll second. All right, I moved. Councilman Martin seconded. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. All right, that passes unanimously. All right, do we have a motion for the approval of the minutes of May 26, 2020 regular session meeting? So moved. All right, right. Councilmember Christensen moved it. Uh, Councilmember Waters Sutter seconded it. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. All right, the motion passes unanimously. Mayor Bagley, before yep. you uh, ask for a motion on June 2nd. Yep. Um, I have a I have I have an addition I'd like to make to those minutes. All right. Uh, what is it? Do that after the motion or before? Um, let's go ahead. I'll I'll move June second, twenty twenty regular session minutes. Do I have a second? Second. All right. I moved it. Councilmember Martin seconded it. Councilmember Waters, do you have an amendment? Well, I do. I uh, at the end of that meeting, I read a statement, uh, and I prefaced it with wanting to read it into the record. And when the minutes came out, there's a reference to the statement, but not the statement. Okay. Um, and if it, unless there's an objection, I, I've sent to Don the written statement. I, I'd like for her to uh, to insert that in lieu of the language that, that's there in reference to comments I made on June 2nd. Is that a motion? It is. All right, I'll second that. Any debate or anybody care? All right, we've got a motion on the table for uh, the approval of the June 2nd, 2020 minutes regular session with the amended suggestions that Dr. Waters just provided. All in favor say aye. 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 All, opposed? All opposed say nay. All right, the motion carries unanimously. All right, onto agenda revisions and submission of documents and motions to direct the city manager to add agenda items to future agendas. Um, I was actually contacted, um, I'm not gonna do it on my own, but if you guys want to, we will. Um, I was asked by Shannon Fender um, of, oh God, what, she was one of the dispensaries. I think it's Native Roots. Sorry, I know she's watching right now and she's wondering why they didn't get the name right. But anyway, so the idea is to have the city um, permit uh, medical marijuana uh, delivery at home. Is that something we want to take up in the future? Councilman Peck. Um, thank you, Mayor Bagley. I think we've already discussed this, and my memory is uh, before the pandemic, I thought we were going to put it on a future agenda. And we were, we were, but that's, that was my that was my recollection as well. But we haven't done yeah. it yet. So, are we all in agreement to put it on the Councilmember Martin? 
Um, I just wanted to add to that. I think the reason that we didn't put it on a future agenda at that time was that the city attorney's office said that they could not uh, predict when they would be able to get to it. So I would like it to be on a future agenda, but um, right, why don't uh, we... I just wanted to correct the record. Great. Just, I don't remember if we ever voted on it. I know we discussed it, but let's go. I, I move that we put the issue of permitting uh, Marijuana, medical marijuana dispensaries in our city limits um, onto the agenda. So we might discuss the possibility of permitting them to uh, deliver uh, at home. I'll second. second. All right, I moved. Council member Douglas Faring uh, seconded. Let's go ahead and vote. All in favor say aye. It, it, this, aye. It, yep, sorry. No discussion. No, discussion. no, you can discuss. I just don't see any hands. Yes, Dr. Waters. Uh, you didn't put a time. For a time it, stamp it, it, on that. Correct. It's it's up. I mean, with COVID, with all these other things going on, it's Very for. Good. I just wanted to make certain that we were. Yep. Nope. It will be on it this way. Degrees of freedom or latitude to the staff. All right. Yes. Very I mean, there's good. very, very, I mean, and even though I could put it on the agenda and was going to, I just figured, you know, I'd like to, I'd like to get counsel input. So all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. All right. The motion carries unanimously. Anybody else? Council Member Waters? Uh, thanks, Mayor Bagley. Um, my reference to the June 2nd minutes, uh, I, I think, carries over into a direction I'd like to give the staff. Um, I chatted with Don about, about the minutes for January 2nd and what I, I thought I would see as having read something into the, into the record of the thought of thinking I was doing that. And in, in that conversation with Don, discovered that or learned that uh, sometime in the past, a previous council gave direction to Val, uh, Don's predecessor, um, uh, not to put statements of council members into the, into the minutes, but to be more cryptic with those minutes. And I understand the reasons for that. Uh, and that, that whole get out of control and you know, there's a lot of time required. Unless um, the statement is provided in writing and then it's just a matter of doing a paste into the minutes. Uh, I guess I'm a little concerned. I'm not pleased, I guess, about uh, having the option to, to without without this kind of activity, you know, correcting the minutes, a previous council to determine whether or not any of us could uh, state something for the record, provide a written co copy to Don, so she could just paste it in the minutes, so she doesn't have to go through watching the tape, etc., um, and establish the record that way. Uh, so and it, it just seems to me that, that, that a, a council ought to be able to decide that for themselves and any member of this council who wanted to make a, a statement for the record ought to be able to do that and not have to amend the minutes or ask for permission uh, to, to be on the record. So, so I'm going gonna, gonna to move yeah, that, yeah. We, that we give direction to Don that if council members have a statement to make and they provide a written copy to her so she's not having to scroll through the tape, that statements for the record are inserted into the written record as minutes, as long as it's provided to Don in writing. I'll second that. So anybody have any comments or can we vote? Councilor Christensen? Um, I think that's a very good idea because we have nothing actually to prove anything that went on at city council meeting except actions. And that was done to uh, make it easier for um, the clerk to not have such a lengthy record. However, it means that in the future, nobody really understands why council voted the way it did because nothing we've said really, it's sort of summed up and uh, nothing we have stated uh, appears in the record. And um, I think that's a very grave mistake for the future. So I, I applaud this. I think it's a very good idea. Provided we do provide uh, the city clerk with the written, a written copy so that the um, newspaper reporters can have it and also a um, digital copy so she can just cut and paste. Mayor, you're muted. I know, I know, I know, I know I was muted. Councilmember Peck, your hand was up first. Did you change your mind? I did. You're I muted did, too. I did change my mind. All right, Councilmember Martin. Uh, I just want to add that we now also have uh, AI automated transcripts. So um, we 
do, probably this would be a good time to make the public aware of it. We actually do have a written transcript of the debate that council makes. So it's good Knowing, to know that. Rem, being reminded, I'm gonna be a lot more careful when how I talk on these video chats because I'm not very careful. So, all right. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Waters. Thanks. I, I, it sounds to me like this, this will be a yes from the council and I should probably keep my mouth shut and just accept a yes on a motion. That yes, you should. Yeah, I know. I just want to reinforce or maybe build on what I heard from council member Christensen. And that is, there, there have been times where in trying to get back to or respond to constituents uh, about what was said, to try to get them a timestamp on the tape, right, and have them scroll through and have to go through the process of watching a videotape to hear what was actually said, depending on you know, what the topic is, uh, seems to be a burden to, to, that you place on the residents. And at least for this one case, to, to lift them of that burden so you can just point them to the minutes, I think, uh, is a service to the community as well as um, uh, the opportunity for council members to be on the record. So I'll be quiet and take a yes if we vote yes. All right, all in favor of permitting council members who make rec comments for the record, on the record, to submit a written copy of those to the city clerk to insert into the record. Say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. All right, motion carries unanimously. Anybody else? All right, cool. Let's go on to the COVID-19 update and emergency items for consideration. Harold, time is yours. Uh, Mayor Council, I'm actually gonna bring some others to the party tonight um, to go through this. We're gonna cover a few things. Um, I want Dan to go first. Dan's gonna cover an update on the numbers that we've had from Boulder County um, at our next uh, meeting. Uh, Jeff Zayak can attend at that meeting. He just um, had a number of uh, commitments and he's been um, coming to our meetings and I think he went to the first one at Louisville tonight or second. Then we will go to Eugene to talk about orders. We just had a, another round of orders that Eugene's gonna brief everyone on. Um, and then Sandy's gonna talk a little bit about fireworks because I know there's been some questions. So Dan, um, take it away. Okay. Uh, Susan has a presentation here. So this is a presentation that was given by the uh, public health epidemiologists. So I will do my very best epidemiologist impression here tonight. And there's a ton of slides here and a lot of them kind of say the same thing. And we will absolutely shoot this over to you guys so that you, you have it. Um, so I'm gonna go pretty quickly through this. So Susan, good luck. And um, here we go. So the, the next one, go down one, please. This is a, if she can. Are you not seeing it? Um, all I see is the is the header slide right now. Let's try that again. There you go. That's the one. So these are numbers ever. So this is, you know, you've all seen these numbers before. So we're at about a thousand cases ever. And then the big number there is the long-term care facility cases. And we'll talk about that a little bit more as we go. So these are our all-time numbers. Um, please go down one, Susan. And then this next slide, and there's- Sorry. Oh, that's okay. Yep, well, oh, down one, there we go. There's a lot of them that look just like this. So I just wanna point out one of these. Boulder County is in the red. This one happens to be case rates. And you'll notice that the trend is flattening out. You know, we've been talking about this flattening the curve thing for a long time. And the trend here is flattening, but it's also, really low compared to everybody else. And this is a trend you'll see on all these little kind of graphs that will flip through. But this is um, kind of a trend that you'll see. So Susan, please go down one again. Um, actually go down one more. And so this, this next slide is about long-term care facilities. So the blue are cases that are not associated with long-term care facilities. So you'll see on the far right there, when we get into June, there aren't many, what is that, brown, tan, orange, something that are long-term care facilities. There's very few. So the message there is, for the most part, the outbreaks have been contained in long-term care facilities. So that's good. So the cases that we're seeing are most, most often not associated with long-term care facilities. And as you can see, as you kind of look in the middle there, all those big spikes 
are, were associated with the long-term care. So that's a good news and that's pretty significant progress. Okay, Susan, could you go down um, three? One more. So this is a kind of a summary of just oops, one more, please. Okay, so this is a, a big trend downward, right? So this is kind of the rolling average percentage of positive test results. So even though testing, the number of tests that they're doing is going up, the percentage of positives are, have trended down and have basically flattened out. So again, that's also good news because it goes all the way back to about, what is that, May 25th, that that trend is pretty flat. And that's also kind of when things were starting to open up here. So this is a good trend for us again. So these are all still kind of good news things that we're seeing as we're leading into this um, summertime area where things really are opening up more and we're going to start seeing people out. You know, we see people at McIntosh Lake all the time, those kind of things that I'm sure we've talked about before. Um, down one more, Susan. So this number we've seen has been pretty steady the whole time too. Longmont still has the highest number of positive or possible problems in Boulder County, but overall Boulder County is still pretty darn low comparable. Um, let's see. Let's go down three, please, Susan. One more, please. One more, please. So this, this next, this is an important one. Um, this certainly is something that um, we talked about and we're, we're trying to figure out some action items associated with it. This is, the green bar is Boulder County population. Remember, this is county, this isn't city. We haven't parsed it out to that level yet. The light blue is COVID-19 cases and the dark blue is hospitalizations. So you can see on the far right there, the Hispanic Latinx percentages are significantly high. So 13% of the overall population and accounting for 45%, nearly half of the cases and 43% of the hospitalizations, that's significant. So what we're attempting to do, this is data we're still trying to get from the county and parse it out to a city level to see how granular we can get so that we can start doing outreach, bringing care to the community. It's something that we're trying to figure out what we can do to be more actionable, especially as we look to planning for um, the next, if there is another spike, what can we do to figure out action items to be more prepared? So this is a pretty significant slide for us as we move forward. Uh, let's see, could you go down two, please, Susan? So this shows you, even though, like we saw Longmont is kind of high in Boulder County, Boulder County as a whole is significantly lower in the hospitalization rates compared to the rest of the state, almost half. So that's, again, pretty solidly good news. Um, yeah, this, is, this is Tim Waters. Would you back, sure. can we ask questions? Of course. Could you go back to that previous slide? Susan? Yes. That one? Yeah. Uh, so uh, I've got a little message box up in the, in the legend where it's hard for me to tell uh, the color coding here. Okay. So the dark blue, yes, is uh, I, I, I it is what the dark blue is deaths. So that's the percentage of deaths. So, so the per, so I'm looking at the per, the 80, 80. six percent, right of the white non Hispanic. That what is this telling me that column? So that's telling, well, as a whole, the, the overall deaths have primarily been associated with long-term care facilities. That's the percentage of the population who have passed away. 80% of them are white, non-Hispanic. Correct. 14.5% of the, of the fatalities are Latinx. That's what yes, I'm sir. seeing. Okay, yes, all right, very good, thanks. Any other questions on that slide? Please feel free to interrupt at any time. Um, I do have a question. Go ahead, yes. Councilmember Dougal Ferry. Um, by the yeah. way, go ahead and speak up because when this is up, I can't call on anybody. I just yeah. see me. Okay, so on when you are looking at um, collecting data on this, the other um, piece is you know look at the jobs too. What what occupations are people of different ethnicities typically doing? So are they in jobs where there are where they have sick leave? Are they having to come in? Is the expectation they're coming in and they're sick? 
uh, especially if we're looking at hourly wages or, um, you know, like, um, and I don't, I don't want to give out any particular stores, but, <laughs> but you know, you just any kind of store where you just go in like one of those big box stores where mm -hmm. you don't have benefits and um, your the expectation is you come in, you do your hours. So, you know, I, I guess looking at the at it holistically as well, too. Those are, this is Harold, those are some questions that we're asking. There's also a really, um, there's also another, um, it's a spreadsheet, but it's on the county site and the state site that really looks at outbreak data. Uh -huh. um, and so that's something else that I look at in terms of what's happening within the community. Okay. Um, and, and Jeff mentioned this the last time that he was on. Um, the only location that, that we, outside of um, um, older adult care facilities, the only one that we had locally that was on the outbreak data was actually Circle Graphics. Okay. Um, and, yeah. and I can say that because that's a, that's a public document. Yeah, I but that's that. another that's another piece of information that we look at, mm -hmm. and I've asked that question to them because we also want to understand: Are we seeing it occur where someone may work in other locations, but yet they're part of Boulder County, so the numbers are going to be reported to us? Yeah. And so those are some of the questions I poured into Jeff and his group. Okay. Okay. And it wasn't there legislation that passed about uh, sick uh, sick leave. Yes. Meat? Yes. So, uh, that should hopefully help some of these cases as well. Thanks. So um, I have a question as well. Oh, sorry, Polly. Um, so this this makes me think of another thing that we might look at. It seems like the, the huge urban areas are also where the outbreaks are really high. My curiosity would be in our Latinx population uh, or just people of color in general are the main, are they the, mostly the people who are living in single family homes or apartment buildings with the, you know, the lack of medical care as well? Um, it would, I would just be curious as to whether it is uh, confined groups of people in a, in a complex, just like uh, the assisted living homes or the nursing homes, that's where the high outbreak is. So uh, much less than the, than the elderly who are living with family or in single family homes on their own. So it would just be curious to me to see where that large outbreak is in our Latinx communities. So, and I can answer some of that. So part of the questions, of, at least conversations, and you know, really what are we seeing? Obviously senior care facilities. Um, the other is um, multi-generational households. Um, and, and, and that's another piece that we're generally seeing is where, where it's driving some of those case numbers. So one individual gets sick, there's no way to separate within the household and then the rest of the household ends up getting, um, ends up getting infected. And so that is one thing that we do know, um, but it's to Dan's point, this is, this is convers these are conversations that we're having in terms of really all cities are having in terms of managing um, alongside Boulder County Health because we're all seeing similar demographics um, in, in terms of this. And so we're all trying to work collectively to see how we dig into it and, and really how we can work on a, a, you know, a different educational campaign and, and really know what we need to focus on if numbers should arise. Right. Any other questions on this one? No, I, I guess I, I guess I was just I read that I, what I'm seeing here. But so just to re reiterate, so basically, long so you have a quarter of our population is Hispanic, um, yet half of the new COVID cases are white and half are Hispanic, so disproportionate. Mm -hmm. And then same thing, more or less with hospital visits, right? But then you've got of the total deaths, eighty percent are white and you know 15 percent are hispanic am i reading that right that's correct so what it looks like to me is that i don't know my question is are hispanic families better at getting treated and going to the hospital they get tested for covid they get treatment and last but not least they survive so it seems to me that they're doing the right thing i don't know if it's so much an instance of latino outbreak as it is going to the hospital and getting help because they're surviving, I mean, uh, at a disproportionate rate to those in our population. 
Yeah, I think it's hard to tell by just these overall numbers, right? I mean, there's things that we don't know in here, demographic data that we don't know. What are the age breakdowns, right? You know, those kind of things. But yeah, so overall, my, I mean, you kind of encapsulated it. But I think that's yeah. why you really want to parse out some of this to be long run right. specific and see really what is kind of in there. Right. So, so again, I guess my only point is that in this whole COVID-19 outbreak, we take a little bit of data, no matter what we want to see, and everybody runs with it. I'm just pointing out that you can take numbers and data and extrapolate whatever you want. So um, to be continued. So. Yeah, I think what we're saying is we need to dig in because we don't have enough data to really understand, to, to figure out what we need to do. And that's what we're partnering on. Right. Okay, let's see. All right, Susan, let's go down. I don't know. Let's try. Um, could I say something? Oh, of course, yes, sorry. Okay. Okay, so I think this is an interesting graph because, um, you know, this is a, this graph is about Boulder County, the number of Latino, Latinx uh, population in Boulder County is 13.8. And so the death rate, and this is wonderful because it's only slightly higher, although death rate's never a good thing, but it looks to me like they are being the, Latin, the Latinx population is being more infected than the regular population, which I think is because of the things that uh, Susie and Joan have said earlier, the jobs, they are more exposed. They tend to be more exposed because they tend to often have more service jobs because it's lower wage and all that. And also they don't have their own homes. So they tend to be in more crowded situations. So as Brian said, this is actually a very positive thing to say how strong the Latinx population is. But I'm wondering if we can do something um, in to be sure that service jobs do have all the service jobs. I, I'm sure King Supers and places like that do have things posted, but all the service jobs need to have explanations of health uh, prevention posted and also all the apartment houses where people might be living and daycare places where people might be. Yeah, I think I know Boulder County is making pretty significant attempts at education campaigns. Um, and it's kind of their, their role to do a lot of that with the business community. Um, to the, the extent of which that's happening, I don't know, but I know that they've made pretty significant efforts in that. They, they just one more thing. A lot of a lot of this information is digital, and I was just reading the early childhood education thing, and um, a lot of people uh, from the uh, Paso program are saying that they do not have access to computers. So that's another problem. If people don't have access to the information, um, where they can go get help, uh, what kind of protocol there is. Uh, yeah, we need to think about how we can get better access for everybody, no matter what their income or their ethnic group. Okay, uh, let's keep let's keep going with the presentation, and let's uh, let's I don't know how, how many other slides do you have? Not to push it through, but uh, let's just try to let's don't take comments or questions till the end. Let's j jot down our questions and comments, and yeah. uh, we'll we'll follow it up at the end so we can get through it. All right. I will condense it into maybe three or four. I'll go quick. Um, let's see, Susan, let's keep going down for a little bit here. Um, keep going. Go. 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 One more. So this is a just a snapshot of all of the hospital resource data in the county. All of it's in the green area. We are really good on hospitalizations right now. I think there's four or five people in the hospital across the county for COVID related incidents right now. Okay, Susan, let's go down four or five more. Hey, hold go on, ahead. Dan. The one, the one thing I want to point out on this slide, if you can go back to that, um, you see two that are in the yellow. That's really more related to the increase in elective procedures um, and, and other um, medical events that's coming in. So when you saw this graph originally, we were not doing any, elect they were not doing any elective procedures. So they have full capacity. They are now bringing on elective procedures. Um, and so that is 
is, is shifting the number, but it, that's what it's related to. Yeah, that's normal business. Yeah. Uh, Susan, go down, do you see Google? Boom, right there. So as, as we know, Google tracks everything. So one of the things that um, the county has done is started to get location data from Google. And this is one of the ways that they start to find, figure out that percentage of social distancing thing. This is one of the variables they use. Now, this is certainly one data point for one section of the population. But the interesting thing here is, and I'm sure that you know Dale has talked about this, that compared to the baseline, look at Boulder County's number on parks. And baseline is sort of pre-COVID. So up 110% of people using parks and open spaces. And the other stuff, you know, retail, recreation, grocery, transit stations, workplaces, basically that's telling us that people are generally staying home at least 20% more than they did pre-COVID. You know, the residential rate's up 5%, but that gigantic number in parks is telling us something too. People are getting out into the open spaces outside, but as a general kind of concept, those retail grocery things are, are down and there's a the tiny bit of data behind that also, but it's, you know, it's only somebody that has a cell phone and has a particular thing turned on, that kind of thing, but. Um, okay, go down a couple, Susan. And one more, one more. So there's, there's, four, there's four or five of these in here. There's, they've got a slide on suicidal ideation. They've got one on suicide attempts. They've got one on alcohol overdoses and um, opioids. And just a couple of messages on this data. One is, it's just interesting that they're starting to track this data related to COVID because it's something that we've started to talk about too related to diversion programs, right? This is something that we know is happening. That, And you can see kind of on that, lower right hand corner, that green graph, those chunks before that pretty solid, that is before the stay at home order. The big dip, the U, is when the stay at home order happened. So, and they all look exactly like this. So what that's really telling us is when the stay at home order hit, people stayed inside like we asked them to. They didn't start to seek care at the hospitals, at their clinics, all those kinds of things, they stayed home and we knew this even on the ambulance transport side, people stayed home until they got really, really, really sick. But this is really starting to at least, public health has become aware and they're collecting data related to this that's showing us what we know anecdotally here, that the, the issues, that, the social issues that we have, the behavioral health issues, the mental health, the substance use have gotten worse because of this. And now we have a little bit of tracking data that Boulder County Public Health is helping us with. Now, again, this is, this is countywide. It's just one tiny data point. It's just hospitals, people that go to the hospital for this particular complaint. But, you know, there's, Susan, you can just scroll down, you know, four or five so they can see that they're tracking these things. Um, keep going. I think the next one is keep going. So they all kind of look like this. You'll see that you keep going. The next one is, there's that big U again. They all kind of look the same. And they've got a few of these and you can look through them at one, when we send this to you and we can answer questions if, if you need to, but they all kind of look the same. Um, and then you go one more. And one thing that we are definitely seeing locally is on the domestic violence side, the numbers aren't necessarily increasing pretty dramatically, but the, the acuity is definitely going up. You know, our victims advocates are responding to chunks and the things that they're going to are a little more significant than, than they were before. But that's kind of what I have. There's a lot more. This is a pretty rich data set in this um, presentation that they did. So feel free to reach out if you have any questions about it. But that's all I have for tonight. All right. Great. Thank you. Um, glad to see that we continue to be on it. All right. Let's go ahead and move on to the presentation of the City of Longmont Comprehensive Annual Financial oh, Report. Okay. We got Eugene and Sandy. Oh, of course, Eugene, the COVID-19 <laughs> nice expert. Mayor. Go ahead. <laughs> Mayor and Council, Eugene May, City Attorney. Uh, so Dan talked about uh, some of the numbers uh, at the county level. I'm going to give you an update on some important announcement by Governor Polis at his press conference yesterday. And he really started the press conference by congratulating and thanking the people of Colorado for doing such a great job on 
social distancing, on masks, on staying at home, and really following the guidance. And, uh, you know, I'm happy I get to report on good news, additional steps about uh, further relaxation of restrictions on the economy and on social life. Uh, so uh, the governor really had two sort of categories. One was more near term, some adjustments he's making uh, under safer at home and in the vast great outdoors. And we expect to see those uh, sort of toward the end of this week. And then he talked about the next phase, which would be, be applicable at the end of June, uh, moving into July. So I'll start with the safer at home changes uh, and then talk about the next phase. Uh, so uh, we're actually very happy to see he put out draft guidance. So the public gets a chance to take a look at this stuff before it goes into effect and to comment on it. Um, based on past practice, you know, when the staff puts out draft guidance, they pretty much stick with it. So, you know, we're, we're pretty confident this is what we're going to see towards the end of the week via an amended safer at home order. Uh, there's new draft guidance for outdoor and indoor larger venues. And um, very happy to see that instead of a one size fits all, which was really a cap of 50 uh, people, which applies to gyms, rec facilities, outdoor pools, that was really sort of the state's maximum number that they wanted to see gather. Now they are looking at different tiers of sizes of venues. Uh, they have a cutoff around 5,600 feet, square feet, and then another one up at 11,000 square feet. And uh, at the 5,600 square feet, outdoor facilities can move up to 125 people at the larger size, up to 175 people. And so, uh, you know, the numbers are nice, but I just think the sort of philosophical change where now we're starting to see uh, tiered approaches instead of a one size fits all is really great. And of course, these venues are going to have to implement uh, strict precautions, which by now we're we're getting pretty used to, you know, six feet social distancing when you're in line, frequent hand washing, no buffet style foods, uh, but they're looking at uh, opening up these venues to activities that were are currently prohibited under the sixth amended safer at home, uh, like receptions, concerts, fairs, uh, those sorts of types of events. So I think, you know, social and economic activity is really going to benefit from this. Uh, the other draft guidance, which uh, would be a change to the current safer at home, would be residential camps. Uh, they pretty much follow the guidelines of current summer camps. Uh, indoors, cohorts of 10. Outdoors, cohorts of 25 campers. And, um, you know, before they didn't want people staying overnight. Now, uh, based upon our numbers and uh the public health uh, capacity and hospital capacity, you know, the state is feeling confident about moving forward. Uh, so the the big news I thought was really uh, the, the governor talking about the next phase, the phase after safer at home. And he's calling this uh, protect our neighbors. And it's really going to sort of shift the focus from statewide control to individual accountability and a reliance on strong local public health authorities. And so the basic concept is if a county or region can demonstrate compliance with certain scientific criteria, uh, then they will have a lot more freedom on what to do in terms of reopening. Uh, so the criteria are pretty similar to what I think we're seeing in the county variance process, low, low disease transmission levels, social distancing at 60% or above, uh, hospital capacity to meet the needs of everyone, as well as the need, uh, the ability to meet a future surge if that were to happen. Uh, and then on the public health side, we keep hearing from Boulder County Public Health, Jeff Zayak, about testing and contact tracing and isolation. That's really going to be the new strategy to target actual outbreaks rather than have everybody stay at home. Let's just have those who uh, test positive and those who come in contact with those people uh, have them stay at home. 
And then the local public health agency needs to demonstrate strong enforcement and compliance uh, capacity to make sure that people are following all the best guidance. And your reward, if you can do this, is really, I thought was quite surprising. Uh, under Protect Our Neighbors, all activities can occur at 50% pre-pandemic capacities, maintaining social distancing and no more than 500 people. They don't want mass gatherings, but large gatherings, if your community can meet all these criteria, uh, would be permissible. Uh, right now, the governor said he's targeting the end of June to implement this next phase, the one after Safer at Home. And uh, there are details still to be worked out. Uh, we're not quite sure what the process is for a county to be authorized to enter into a protect our neighbors phase. Uh, but I think the general message is um, very positive that uh, the state of Colorado is doing a great job. And uh, we are going to be able to, you know, take baby steps towards returning to a normal life uh, pre-pandemic. Uh, so that is really the update from what the governor had to say yesterday. And, and we think of these as very positive and the lawyers love being able to take a look at this in draft form before it comes out. Uh, so we're able to advise the city on, on what sort of impacts this would have on municipal operations. All right, thanks, Eugene. Harold, anybody else that you want to pull out? Sandy. Sandy Cedar. Hello, Mayor, members of council, Sandy Cedar, Assistant City Manager. I'm here to give you a brief update on the fireworks um, that the Kiwanis have requested a use of public places permit around. Um, so we asked them to go ahead and just go through our normal process for these kinds of events. Uh, although this is a no gathering event this time. And so they have put together a use of public places permit request. Our staff looked at it um, and gave a conditional approval pending what was going on with Boulder County. Boulder County looked at it and decided that they uh, felt that if, this, if there was no gathering and there were some additional conditions uh, that the Kiwanis could hold the event. And so then it came back to the city to determine whether we could meet the conditions that were set out by Boulder County. So I've sent you that information before with the list of what they've said. Essentially, you know, the no gathering, some of the things that you're hearing from Eugene, just ensuring that we're able to manage that uh, from a public safety standpoint, from a park standpoint, et cetera. Our staff met yesterday to talk through some of these issues and there's lots of details to work through. So they're still in that process, but Harold wanted to take the opportunity tonight to get any feedback from the council. Um, I do believe that the UOPP group, including Don Quintana, who's the one that would have to in, uh, issue the permit if it was approved, uh, really want Harold's <laughs> <laughs> um, perspective on it. And of course, he would like yours. So that's the update on where we are. We're still trying to work through to make sure that we would be able to do things. Some of the um, planning is around closing Dickens Farm Park, for example, because it's a pretty sensitive brand new construction area. And so we wouldn't want for people to gather there and either injure the area or it's also pretty close to the fallout zone. As we are now talking about the fire training center at First and Martin rather than the Boulder County Fairgrounds. Um, the Kiwanis have uh, changed their contract to only have super high flying fireworks so that there won't be low ones, but really high ones so that people can see it from far distances. And our public safety folks have worked out different ways to be able to patrol to ensure that there isn't too much gathering. Of course, who knows how that will actually work. So that's why we wanted to consult with you all to see if you had any thoughts that you wanted to share with Harold um, as the team also brings together their operational plans for him to consider. All right, if we have any thoughts tonight, we've gotten, the, gotten kind of in the habit of start talking. Instead of talking, make a motion, meaning make a motion or let's don't share our opinion because uh, opinions are great, but make a motion or say nothing. Anybody want to make it with Dr. Waters? I'm going to move that we have the opportunity to provide the feedback that Sandy asked for. And, and that's, that's fine. That's fine. Do we have a second? But my point is, but feedback from count, my point is um, feedback from council. I just want to make sure that we don't uh, get astray. 
Meaning with all due respect, I, yeah. I, I understand what you're trying to do. I mm -hmm. don't think they ask for direction. They ask for input. So I can, my motion is I'd like to provide some feedback. All right, go, go, just go ahead, Dr. Watt. Just go ahead, just go ahead. Um, so I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'll be, I'm gonna be the poor, I'm gonna be the rainmaker, not rainmaker. I'm gonna pour cold water on the idea, I guess. Um, I, listen, I love 4th of July. It, it's, it's like the great celebration of the year for, for me and my family. That said, uh, I, I mean, I, I hope you have a great plan for keeping people out of Dickens Park. Because we have seen what's happened as people are returning to nature, they're trashing it. And I, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to attribute that to long monitors, but I will say this, uh, we had, we had grandpa grandparent duty today. And uh, so we took our granddaughters to Dickens Park uh, and we didn't stay long. It is overwhelmed with people. And, and I'm probably the, maybe there's one other person out there besides me with a mask on. Um, I mean, kids everywhere, social distancing is, is a myth under that circumstance. And I honestly, Sandy, I don't know, see how you possibly keep, when the sun goes down, how you're gonna keep people out of Dickens Park unless you're gonna put some force, this would not be a good use of our police department, shoulder to shoulder to keep people out of there. If we're the only community in the front range that's gonna do a fire range or a firework show, which I think is likely. I mean, people are going to come from everywhere. So I guess where, you know, it would be helpful to know where would they park? How, we're, how what is the plan? Because we're already getting incoming emails about this. We're reading about it in, in the TC line. And honestly, obviously the, the community's divided on it. You know, some people think it's the greatest thing since sliced bread that we're going to do this. Um, you know, the, the finances aside, uh, the city's going to put a fair amount of money into policing that night, no matter what happens. We do every year in a year where we could use those dollars in other places. I just, I just wonder why we would be, I mean, I appreciate the, the Kiwanis Club and making the commitment. If, if, it, if for fire danger was a reason to not do this once upon a time a few years ago, I think we have plenty of reasons to say, we don't need to do this this year. We can celebrate in all kinds of ways. So that's my input. Uh, all right, hold on. So th that's input, but right now, so going back to our, my original point, so is that a motion to cancel the fireworks? I don't think they were asking. No, I'm not making a motion to cancel. The fire. So, I so, might before we're finished. I'd like so, to hear the input. Right. So, right. So my, my only question is, so right now, Sandy, are, so I guess I, there's a, I'm trying to understand the difference between input and direction. Okay. Because uh, and I'm trying to get it so that rather than seven of us are talking and just sharing our ideas, that four of us come to some type of consensus. So my question is, if you want input, I mean, are you looking to say, okay, we're good? Or you want us to cancel? What are you looking for? I think so, recognizing, I mean, oh, sorry, Harold, go ahead. No, go ahead, Sandy, and then I'll jump so, in. You know, recognizing that you are getting public input. Um, we were just curious as to, you know, your thoughts on it, whether, you know, I think from Harold's point of view, he's going to get the operational plans from all the staff members. And so what we were looking at is, you know, regardless of whether it goes or doesn't go, you all are going to receive information and, um, you know, comments from residents. And so we were really just looking to find out what your thoughts are around it um, for him to consider as we look at the permit process. I, I should also mention that um, at least so far, Greeley, Berthoud, and Frederick or Firestone will be holding fireworks. So to some extent, we have a little less to worry about on the east, but your point is well taken about people that'll be coming in. We'd like to know your concerns so that we can address them as part of the planning. Okay, so, Council Mayor Peck. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. Um, you know, we just heard Eugene's report on Polis's uh, Protect Our Neighbors, which is the next phase that will start in July. If, how in the world, when he's saying you can have 500 people together outside, if I understood Eugene's report correctly, how in the world are you gonna keep them out of Dickens Park or anywhere? Um, and, and I think that tempers will flare if we try to police that. And I'm not sure that's a good look for us right now. Um, we're trying to ease into this opening up further and this is, like the big bang theory right here. And uh, so 
when you sent out those that email, Sandy, asking for our thoughts on this, and you said reply only to me, I was kind of curious as to what the other counselors thought. Did they think that we should have it at that point? Is that why the city went ahead and, and continued to investigate it? Or I, I don't know what the other people thought on this council. So I'm really glad to hear their thoughts. Uh, we only sent that one email that was reply to you. Um, so that's my thought. I, I, I don't see how you're gonna keep people out. They're gonna be drinking and partying because it's the 4th of July. And um, once we reopen uh, in July, once Paula says you can have bigger venues, I don't know. I don't, I don't see this going well. Thank you. Councilman Beck, I'm sorry, Councilman Christensen. Well, I have to say, I agree with uh, Councilman Waters and I agree with Councilwoman Peck. I really, I love the 4th of July. I think we all love the 4th of July. It's a, you know, it's a wonderful time to get together with the family and it's the one time of year we don't have to do anything really. <laughs> But it is also um, it is also classically a big opportunity for a lot of people to get drunk and shoot off things and do, you know be <laughs> kind of irresponsible. We spend a lot of money every year on the police policing this when people are driving all over town. That wouldn't necessarily be the case now, but trying to police it when people are so frustrated. I mean, I see both sides. People are very frustrated. They would like something to celebrate. They would like to celebrate our country. They would, but I really, I also don't think this is gonna work out very well. And I think this is a sacrifice that we could, that this town could make for this year because we're in the middle of, of uh, a pandemic. And we all understand that we're also in the middle of an economic, um, crisis and um, even though it's hard to give up 4th of July, I think we should do that this year. Councilman Martin. If we couldn't have a citywide demonstration type event that doesn't involve gathering, like you know, for a long time during stay at home, we had howling um, at, at 8 p.m. And um, maybe we could promote the idea of people staying home or staying on their own block. So it would be a gathering of fewer than 50 people. Um, and we'd have Liberty Bells and sparklers and things like that. And, and um, you know, have the Halloween block uh, or Halloween, the Independence Day block party instead of something that causes uh, centralization. Um, I can't imagine, even if the city gave away sparklers, it wouldn't be any more expensive than um, those giant fireworks. Anybody else want to say anything? All right, is that good enough input? I think we should have our 4th of July fireworks. It's outside. Um, I, I, I continue to question um, based on the data that we're hearing why, why we continue as a society to uh, uh, limit our freedoms. It, it just, it's just self-inflicted wound after self-inflicted wound. We just stayed inside for two months. Half of this community isn't social distancing at all. And the others are still locked up. So um, I don't want to debate it. I'm just saying my point is, I think we should have the fireworks. It's outside, stay six feet away from your neighbor, wear your mask and let's celebrate the, the, the fourth. And uh, Councilor Waters. If you don't want to debate it, you probably shouldn't bring it up that way. Because um, that, because that's what you've opened up now, right? Uh, if, if I was confident, I mean, we, we've all seen the percentages, Mayor Bagley, on um, in the, the risks of infection when people, when everybody wears a mask and we're all six feet at least apart. We also know that we got way too many people not wearing a mask and ignore social distancing. So, I mean, I, we can we, we can say whatever we want to say about the data. I know you've, I, on several occasions, I've heard you talk about an alleged pandemic. 
seems to me that two over two million Americans infected and now 120,000 of them dead, 200,000 projected by the end of August, and sub epidemiologists projecting 60 to 70 percent of our population infected if things can keep going the way they are, which would be 1.8 to 2.1 million Americans dying. I mean, we all want to return to, we, nobody wants to squelch anybody's freedoms, but responsibility goes along with your rights, right? And once we can get that right, I'm going to be way more comfortable with bringing large groups together. But until we're clear that we have responsibilities to go with our rights, then somebody has to be an adult about public health and safety. And I think it's up to us to be the adults in, the, in that conversation. All right. Now I'm going to respond. I love you to death, Doc. But that's not what I said, right? I didn't say, hey, let's go ahead and have an attack and to refer to things I've said in the past and whatnot. Um, all I'm saying is about fireworks. We're all going to be outside. So I don't appreciate I mean, I've never said this alleged pandemic. My criticism has been the severity of our response. The economic conditions of this country and our community are self-inflicted. That has been it. We have acted without the data and continue every single time we have this discussion to do action after action, wearing masks, pointing fingers, and it's left versus right. It's a politicized situation. And all I'm saying is I think we should have the fireworks. That's all I said. So anyway, Councilmember Martin. Just for the record. No, 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 no. Councilmember no, Martin. No, no. You're out of order. Times. You're uh, Dr. Multiple Waters. You're, times you've Dr. Wa the, Dr. Waters, the, the you're out of order. Pandemic. Cut them off. You're out Both of order. Both of you are out of Council, order. I have the Council floor. Member, yes, you do, Councilmember Martin. Yeah. Okay. So I am not that I'm not concerned about people's lives, but I am also being beginning to be concerned that we are in a research crunch due to reduced revenue, both for our businesses and more importantly in this particular case, for the staff that maintains this city. And I'm concerned about the environmental dam damage that a lot of people who aren't going to work are already inflicting on our sensitive areas like McIntosh Lake, which is turning into a wallow, and we can't police it. And now we have this beautiful, barely restored uh, riparian corridor in, Dickin, in the form of Dickens Farm Park. And those young plants are, are still in the fragile stage of their existence. And yet we're doing something that is going to invite people to go out and trample them. And we know. Um, Marcy, there you go. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. I felt, how much, what did I say last? Or have I been we, muted the whole time? No, trample no, them. We no, know. Ten said, trample ago. the plants. 10 seconds, okay. Yeah, so we get the plants um, uh, that will be will be trampled into the mud if, if people go off and go tromping across Dickens Farm Park to get a better view of the, of the fireworks. And it just seems to me that there is something else we can do because the, the damage that the public will inflict on the areas that we have been working at the public's behest to restore and protect um, is starting to be incalculable and we don't have a lot of money to throw at fixing it again. Okay, Dr. Waters. All right, anybody else want to provide input? All right, so Harold, it sounds like there's been no motion, but it sounds like we're not having fireworks. Is that what you're so hearing? When, so what I need to hear, I needed to hear this because we're also hearing a lot of different conversations. Um, at the end of the day, you know, what I also heard is concerns about gatherings and those types of issues. Frankly, we're having the same conversation internally and I'm having to, to sort through this issue. And so I wanted to hear what you all were hearing from your constituents and your community as I take all of this information. I don't know today whether or not we can operationally do what we need to do to comply with the orders. I still got to go through that, but I needed something to hear. I needed to hear from you all in terms of what we were, 
what your thoughts were and what you were hearing from your constituents. Um, and I know it was a tough conversation, um, but that's why we were reaching out trying to, to get that information to make sure we were getting it from as many venues as we possibly can. Um, because I know whatever decision I'm gonna make, I'm gonna make somebody mad. And um, I needed that input in into this conversation. Councilmember Martin? Uh, may I suggest as a pilot program, you see if the staff can halt the damage to Mac and Wattosh Lake. All right, Harold, did anything else from us? That's all I need. All right, sorry if I'm grumpy, Doc. Still love you. I, I love you too, young man. <laughs> I just want my fireworks. All right, let's go ahead with, uh, let's go on with the consent agenda. Do you want to read that for us, Don? Sorry, Mayor, I believe we need to go to special reports, the presentation of the capper. Uh, we can do the budget report first, sure. <laughs> uh, this is Jim Golden, Chief Financial Officer. Um, can you hear me? Okay. All right, so I wanted to just present this item, um, introduce it first, actually. Annually, we present the uh, comprehensive annual financial report along with the annual audit to you all. And at that time, we do make a presentation on the award of the GFOA Certificate of Achievement for financial reporting for the prior year as CAFR. And I just wanted to uh, assure the, the council that the, uh, the city did achieve that award once more due to the physical limitations. We're not doing any presentation on that tonight, but credit for that goes to the full accounting division uh, led by accounting manager, Deanne Hansen. Uh, lead accountants, uh, Sammy Colson and Susie McGinley, and accountants, Kim Klug, Carlin Gonzalez, and Haley Bereth. Um, this uh, 2019 audit you'll be receiving tonight, it's the city's first with the accounting firm of Plant Moran that was hired about uh, six months ago to work with us through this process. So the gentleman that you'll be introduced to tonight is the first time they've been meeting with the council. Uh, and with that, I'm going to uh, turn this over to accounting manager Deanne Hansen so she can summarize uh, what's in her council communication uh, covering the CAFR data. Hello, council and mayor. It's Deanne Hansen, accounting manager. Um, I'd like to thank you all for supporting our operations and what we do. Um, this CAFR this year through the circumstances was um, a little more challenging than normal, but um, we made it through. Um, I'd like to give a special thank to Susie McGinley and Sammy Colson, our lead accountants for all their hard work and the rest of our accounting team, um, that they, they, the hard work they put into this CAFR. Um, so as Jim said, the city didn't, did engage Plant Moran to perform our audit of the financial statements. Um, William Bricky and Timothy St. Andrew directed the audit and they will present the auditor comments um, and respond to any questions from council. So just a couple of quick, quick highlights on where the city finished for the year. Um, so we finished with a total net position of $1.242 billion for the year. The governmental activities make up 508 million of that and the business type activities make up $734 million. That's an increase in net position of 56 million from 2018. You can see the financial highlights associated with um, the city's, city's net position in the management discussion and analysis on page 30 of your CAFR. For more relevant information pertaining to fund balances and change in net position of major governmental funds, um, they can be found on page 46 and 48 of the CAFR. And um, if you look in your council communication on page three, um, the major enterprise funds net position and working capital can be found on page 54 through 55 of your CAFR and on page five of your communication. And then um, total assets held in trust for our retirement benefits 
equal 146.4 million. And this information can be found on pages 217 through 218 of the CAFR or on page four, there's a summary in your council communication. So with that, um, I will introduce William Bricky and Timothy St. Andrew um, of Plant Moran to present auditor comments. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Am I, am I good here? Can everyone see me, hear me? We sure can. Yep, outstanding, great. Uh, thank you, Dan, for that introduction. So I'm, uh, we're, we're a little less formal than William and Timothy. Uh, so I'm Bill Bricky, the audit partner on your account, and uh, Tim is the audit manager. And as mentioned, we're here to talk about uh, the audit for the year ended December 31st, uh, 2019. So there really are three main deliverables uh, related to your audit. There's the financial statements, uh, which includes our opinion. Uh, that's often referred to as the CAFR or the Comprehensive Financial Audit Report. Uh, we also have the single audit, which is our audit of your compliance with your federal grants. Uh, the city actually includes that in the back of the CAFR, but it is actually a separate audit uh, on compliance. And then finally, we have our end of audit letter to mayor and city council, which really is, is a communication to you about the audit process uh, itself. Um, I do know attached to your agenda are, are many more items than that, but many of those items are really just components of those three uh, main deliverables. Uh, so as mentioned earlier, this was our first year uh, as, your, as your auditors, and uh, I'm sure as Deanne and your, your team could tell you, uh, first year audits can be a challenge as we kind of learn about the city, your procedures, your internal controls, things like that. Uh, obviously, on top of that, you know, COVID-19 kind of hit us, and so we had to do a majority of our work uh, remotely. And, and I really just wanted to thank, you know, Jim and Deanne and their entire team for their efforts. I mean, it really was a, a monumental task um, to get through it just because of everything going on. You know, COVID kind of hit in the middle of our audit. And so um, really a great job from your entire team helping us complete the audit uh, on time. So we appreciate all of that. So when it comes to the deliverables, um, you know, we have covered all of these in great detail with management. And so our plan tonight was really just to, to go through the highlights, but certainly if you have any questions or want us to get into more detail, we're absolutely happy to do that. Uh, so the first thing I wanna, I wanna um, discuss is really our primary deliverable to you as your auditor is our opinion on your financial statements. Uh, so that's included in, in the CAFR, page 27 through 29, and I believe is the fourth attachment uh, in your packet. Uh, so the city did receive an unmodified audit opinion in the current year. And that basically means the financial statements are in compliance with all the rules and regulations. Uh, it's often referred to uh, as a clean opinion or a clean audit report. So uh, certainly uh, what you wanna receive and you did receive that unmodified opinion. Uh, the only, uh, I'll say, unusual thing included in the opinion, and, and it's at the top of the second page of our opinion, is we do have uh, an emphasis of matter paragraph in the current year. So, so one item that we identified as part of the audit is there was a prior period adjustment booked in, in, the, in the CAFR related to the city's treatment of their previous uh, retiree healthcare or OPEB trust fund. And we'll get into some of the details on that as we talk through our audit findings. So you'll notice that we just refer to that that restatement basically in our opinion and refer the reader to note 24. Um, so that's something you don't, don't always see. So I wanted to point that out. Um, so with that, what I wanna do now is kind of have Tim go through some of our, our uh, highlights and our actual audit reports and our audit findings. Um, so I will turn it over to Tim. Okay, thank you, Bill. Good evening, Mayor and Council. So I will start and really spend most of the time on the end of audit letter that was included in the package. And as Bill mentioned, the purpose of this letter is really to structure our communication back to you as it pertains to the results of the audit. And so there are two sections to the letter. Uh, section one would be the required communications that we have to have with city council. And section two would be a few uh, general recommendations that were identified uh, during the audit. And so what I'll do is I'll walk you through the letter and just touch on some of the highlights. And so I'm not sure if you have if you have the letter in front of you or not, but I will refer to page numbers uh, in the event that you do. And so I'll start at the bottom of page two. And there were a few new accounting standards that the city had to implement in 2019. 
Uh, so you can see GASB statement number 83, 84, and 90. Now, fortunately for the city, the impact uh, to the city was relatively minor. So the implementation of these standards uh, wasn't, wasn't terribly complicated. On the top of page three, you'll see that there was a, a new standard, GASB statement number 95. And now this was issued by GASB as a result of COVID. And essentially what that does is it delays some of the other standards that would have been implemented in 2019 and delays uh, some of the new standards that will be implemented in future years. So it gives some reprieve to uh, local units of government. On the middle of page three, we, we speak of the accounting estimates with the most significant being the pension and retiree healthcare liabilities and expenses. And those are calculated by the city's actuary. And the second accounting estimate that we discuss is the estimated unbilled revenue in the city's utility related enterprise funds. So we evaluated the estimates, we evaluated the key assumptions uh, to conclude that they were reasonably stated. Uh, moving down to the bottom of page three, top of page four, uh, we didn't have any significant difficulties in performing the audit. We didn't have any disagreements with management. Uh, we did have uh, some uncorrected misstatements that were identified during the audit, and those would be summarized on pages six through eight in this letter. These are uh, relatively minor items, and, and so, Therefore, we, we, as part of the audit, didn't require the city to record them in the financial statements, but whenever we have, uh, even if minor, uh, uncorrected misstatements, we do have to share those with you. And on page five of the letter, which is section two, uh, these will be the other recommendations that were identified. Uh, the first one relates to reconciliations as we are going through the audit. Uh, it, it was noted that there, there were certain receivable and payable balances that didn't have formal reconciliations or subsidiary ledgers that were available. Now we were able to perform the audit. We were able to do the testing through the general ledger and so there were no issues with the balances, but we would recommend that the city consider fine tuning those reconciliations just to help them validate that the balances are accurate and complete. And the second recommendation uh, relates to the GASB 34 fund, and this would be our full accrual financial statements. Uh, there is a fair amount of work that is done, uh, manual work that's done to get those balances completed and to get those balances into the financial statements. Um, and with the newer ERP system and, and certainly the transition to the new uh, financial statement software, we would recommend that those balances uh, all get input into the general ledger, which will make preparing those financial statements much easier for your accounting team. So before I move on to the findings, any, any questions on the letter? No, nope. go ahead. Okay. Seeing none, okay. So the, the second piece that I'd like to cover, and, and you'll have to go all the way back to page 281 in the CAFR, but this would be the findings that were identified during the audit. And the first one uh, relates to a couple of journal entries that we identified as part of our audit and as part of the audit uh, procedures that we were performing. Now, I always like to say we're happy to help when we do identify any entries that need to be recorded, uh, but, but unfortunately we do have to communicate those to you as a deficiency. And so about a decade ago, the auditing standards set the bar really, really low when it comes to these kind of things. Um, and really from the auditing standard standpoint, the expectation is that when we come in as the auditors, everything is ready, everything is clean, and we have zero adjustments. But in reality, that's very uncommon, especially when you think through just the volume of transactions and the volume of activity that the city has, mistakes are bound to happen. So again, we're happy to help and identify those uh, to make sure that the financial statements are complete and accurate. We just have to report to you that we did have a few adjustments that we identified. And the second issue, as, as Bill had commented on, relates to the, the OPEB fund, the Retiree Healthcare Fund, uh, in previous, CAFRs, uh, there, that fund would have been uh, presented as an agency fund. And as we dug into it and worked with management, uh, reviewed the funding sources, uh, really coupled with the fact that, that there isn't a formal trust set up for those funds, uh, we, did, we did conclude uh, that, that those OPEB balances should really be reported within the city's financial statements and not a separate agency fund. And so that was the prior period adjustment that Bill alluded to that uh, was really just moving that activity from an agency fund back into the city's financial statements. 
So with that, we would be happy to cover, uh, answer any questions that you may have. All right, we don't see any questions, but we just want to say thank you for your work. Council Member Waters. Uh, yeah, just a question, then maybe a comment. Um, on page uh, 281, uh, these, I see the two findings with material weaknesses. What's the, what was the test of materiality uh, that, that you applied in this audit that would cause that one? I can see the, I can see the numbers on the other one, although it's a wash, and it's just an accounting function. Mm -hmm. Uh, what was the test of materiality on, on that first um, material weakness? On the first so, one? Yeah. Oh, go ahead, Bill. Uh, go ahead. I was going to say, so when, it, so when it comes to um, our evaluation of these issues, the one thing we have to look at is not only were the journal entries themselves material, which is something we calculated internally, but also could they have been material? And so when it comes to, to certain adjustments, we, we evaluate like what caused this balance to be wrong and could it have been material? So even if it wasn't, could it have been? So as Tim mentioned earlier, the bar is pretty low. So unless it really is some sort of inconsequential transaction that could never be a big number, then you know, otherwise we have to really consider whether it, it's a material weakness. Got it, all right, thanks. Uh, so the comment is this, given the, given the scope of work and, and the accounting for which our business office, our financial services department is responsible, uh, to find, to get this audit report with, with two material weaknesses, one of which may have been material, maybe not, depending on, you know, what happened. And the other was a, kind of a, a, a journal entry, it looked to me like, uh, in terms of the, the, re the retirement fund. I think it's pretty extraordinary. Uh, having looked at other audits, and I want to say to Jim and his crew, good on you. Um, what, a, what an awesome body of work that results in, in this kind of an audit, in my view. That was a lot better than my thank you. Anything else? <laughs> All right, I'll still add, thank you. Thanks, gentlemen. All right. thank, thank you, you guys. Thank, thank you, Jim. All right, let's go ahead and move on to first call public invited. Actually, we're at eight, now let's do first call public invited to be heard. How many people are in the queue? Do we have anybody yet? We Mayor, don't, we, Mayor, we, go ahead, Susan. We would need to display the screen and give the public time to call in. The meeting's right, locked. Let's, let's take a five minute break while we do that. Anybody opposed? All right, let's do that.
All right, if everybody can hear me, let's start thinking about getting back. Mayor, when you and the board are ready, we do have several guests. Looks like we have four callers at this time. And Mayor, just confirming you have a timer ready or would you like? Yeah, so let's go ahead and close off the room and then uh, I've got a timer and we'll get going. Okay, callers, I will identify you by the last three digits of your phone number. I will unmute you. If you could please state your name and your address before you speak, you will have three minutes. I'm going to unmute the first caller. Your number ends in 005. Go ahead. Hello. Uh, yes. Hi. It's Anton Dworak. Uh, 425 Longview Court, Longmont, Colorado. Thank you very much. Um, I am a uh, business owner and property owner in downtown Longmont. I sent you all an email last week about some of my concerns about downtown Longmont. And I believe that at the end of June, we're going to see in downtown Longmont, based on the financials, frankly, is pretty grim. And we're going to see a lot more closures, permanent closures, unless there is hope given by government action towards uh, incentives, programs that people decide, you know, I'm going to give it one more month. I'm going to give it a few more weeks. I'm going to give it this much more because I'm seeing the leadership from the city council. In my email, I raised two things, one of which I think is happening independent from you, which is closing some lanes of Main Street, um, but to the extent that you can support that, I encourage you to do so, and that gives people, pedestrians, the ability to walk down Main Street on the, with the closed lanes from 2nd to 6th, to browse, to allow the restaurants to have more space, to allow people to feel safe with their masks and their distancing. Uh, to be able to really enjoy and browse businesses and enjoy restaurants. The other thing I brought up in my email was the concept of making downtown a con common consumption area. And I've read the statute. I know that's a process. Uh, we're gonna have to create an entertainment district. There's gonna have to be a board. There's gonna be a um, time period and zoning and things along those lines. And I've recognized now that's going to take some time. And all I would ask from you is you have the ability to direct city staff to not do this when you have the time, but to do it now, to start pushing, because all of you ran, I think all of you ran on a platform of a strong downtown. And if you continue to run on that, and say that in these meetings, it becomes a platitude if you don't back that up with some action. So push staff, push city attorney's office to get these ordinances in front of you at your next readings about the common consumption zone. Now, I recognize that's not good, that's going to take some time, but I have a solution for you that was created by our dear mutual friend, Sean Lewis, now the city manager at the city of Inglewood. And he using the same emergency powers that I believe you granted Mr. Dominguez has lifted the open container rules in specific zones under specific rules in, on South Broadway in Inglewood. Mr. Mr. Dwork, I'm gonna to have to cut you off. That's three minutes, a little over, but we appreciate your point. All right, let's go ahead. Uh, next caller. Next caller, Mayor. Uh, your phone number ends in 637. I'm gonna unmute you. If you could please state your 
name and your address before you speak. Go Hi, ahead. my name is Pearl Spinhart. Thank you. My name is Pearl Spinharney and I live at 1910 Spruce Avenue. Good evening, City Council members. I called in the last two meetings and I'm calling again about short-term rental rules and regulations. Since I called in last week, two Longmont residents have reached out with sympathetic concerns. One woman is a would-be home buyer and is going to wait to invest in a home in Longmont until she can ensure that her neighbors will not be investment properties for short-term rental. I also spoke to a homeowner on her street who lives next to the new potential Airbnb. She is equally upset and frustrated and extremely surprised that this is a legal practice in our town. From what I understand, these short-term rental regulations were put into place about a year and a half ago. I urge you to revisit and reconsider how this is upsetting neighborhoods and homeowners in Longmont and change these short-term rental guidelines. On your website, you state that short-term rentals should not create nuisances for the surrounding neighborhood. How do you plan to enforce this and guarantee to residents that you won't let this happen? Thank you so much for your time. Go ahead and call the next one. Pretty please. Yes, of course. The next caller, your phone number ends in 907. I'm going to unmute you. If you could please state your name and your address before you speak, you have three minutes. You're unmuted. Good evening, Council. This is John Creighton, uh, 328 Pratt Street, and president of High Plains Bank at 600 Kimbark. Um, I want to thank you all and, and the city for the support of the Strongmont Fund um, that is providing critical dollars to many of our businesses. And I also would like to urge you all to support um, creative, if perhaps unusual ideas to um, help uh, businesses in Longmont, including support for the road closure um, downtown from 2nd to 6th um, and potential for other things like uh, lifting the open container law. As you know, the uh, time is of the essence for every business in our community. Um, every day that a few extra dollars can be earned uh, increases the odds that another business might make it through the other side of the situation that we're in right now. What makes downtown Longmont particularly fragile um, is that the high proportion of locally owned businesses. And as you know, uh, very small locally owned businesses are often working at the margin in normal time. And when uh, times like this happen, it really puts them on the edge. And as was stated earlier, we're seeing far too many uh, businesses that are teetering on the brink of never opening again. So if we can be creative to support these businesses, it in part is about increasing their revenue but it is also in part showing them our support for them and to increase their emotional energy to continue. Um, this is not just a matter of uh, sales tax or retaining jobs. We really are, particularly in downtown, fighting for the character of our community. Now, absolutely lane closures, uh, potentially uh, lifting the open container uh, rules, may create some inconvenience. I think there's ways to address that, like putting time limits on things for open containers, um, not after dark. Um, and lane closures would be inconvenient for commuters. But many of our businesses have endured uh, inconveniences beyond imagine. And so if we can step up and help them, I think it would go a great way in terms of moving our community forward for the long term. Appreciate um, what you all are doing and uh, appreciate the time. All right, thank you, Mr. Creighton. All right, that's it for public invited to be heard, correct? No, Mayor, we have one more guest. All right, great, let's do it. Yes, uh, your phone number ends in 820. You've been unmuted. Please state your name and your address before your three minutes. Hello, my name is Catherine Baylock and I live at 1920 Spruce Avenue. I'm calling in for the third time asking city council to please change the short-term rental laws in the city of Longmont. There is a short-term rental property at 1883 Arapaho that borders our backyard. Every week there are new parties vacationing on that property. Sometimes there are two different rental parties in the same week. 
These people don't care about the neighbors. They're loud, smoke cigarettes and pot, play loud music day and night. My neighbors and I don't think it's fair that we literally have this hotel in our backyards. We don't know any of the people who occupy the house and feels this violates our privacy and safety. Zoning code laws keep hotels out of residential neighborhoods for a reason, and they exist to accommodate the inevitable disruptions of tourism. Why don't these short-term rentals, which are basically hotels, fall under these zoning restrictions? This short-term rental house was just bought in March for $750,000. It is an investment property making the owner money while all of the neighbors pay the price of having a literal hotel bordering all of our properties in the middle of our quiet neighborhood. Short-term rent short rental renters have no stake in the community and therefore no reason to care about how the neighborhood around them suffers from their vacation activities. Here in Longmont, we currently have an affordable housing shortage, making it possible for wealthy investors to buy houses and turn them into short-term rental properties makes the affordable housing shortage worse. It shrinks the long-term rental market and, increasing and increases housing prices in our already extremely expensive housing market. As long-term residents get priced out of neighborhood, neighborhoods, who remains? Only those who already own a home and don't rent it out short-term. Goodbye new families or basically anyone who can't afford to compete with vacationers' budgets. Cities all over the country are moving to more aggressively regulate short-term rentals. Miami Beach rentals under six months and a day are banned in residential neighborhoods. In Los Angeles, short-term rentals are illegal for less than 30 days in areas zoned as single-family residential neighborhoods. In New York City, it is illegal to rent out an entire residence for less than 30 days. These big cities have protected their residential neighborhoods from what my neighbors and I have been experiencing since early May. Longmont City Council, please follow along with Miami Beach, Los Angeles, New York City, and many other countries around the country to protect our residential neighborhoods and the people that are proud to live in this community. Please change, change the short-term rental laws in the city of Longmont so we don't have to deal with new renters every week. Please consider some of the restrictions the cities in my examples have implemented, such as banning short-term rentals under six months in residential right. neighborhoods so we can have our privacy and quiet backyard communities back. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. That concludes public, our first call public invited to be heard. Um, Don, can you go ahead and read the consent agenda? Absolutely, Mayor. Item 8A is Ordinance 2020-26. A bill for an ordinance making additional appropriations for expenses and liabilities of the City of Longmont for the fiscal year beginning January 1st, 2020. Public hearing and second reading scheduled for June 30th, 2020. 8B is Ordinance 2020-27. A bill for an ordinance conditionally approving the vacation of a five-foot wide electrical utility easement within the Brussel Subdivision Conveyance Plat Filing 1, generally located east of Mountain Crest Court, south of Maxwell Avenue, and west of High Plains Drive. Public hearing and second reading scheduled for June 30th, 2020. 8C is resolution 2020-52, a resolution of the Longmont City Council directing the mayor to sign a warranty deed to combine two ex existing city parcels of the Newbie Farm open space into a single parcel. 8D is resolution 2020-53, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the intergovernmental agreement between the city and state board of land commissioners for the lease of state trust lands. 8E is resolution 2020-54, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Longmont, Colorado, declaring a statement of solidarity in response to the killing of George Floyd and the protests that have followed. And 8F is approve a letter to Colorado's congressional delegation regarding water infra infrastructure and affordability needs for the next stimulus package. No presentations on any of these, Mayor. Councilmember Martin. I move the consent agenda. Second. All right. So, so council member, uh, council member Patch. <laughs> I'm glad you remembered my name. Oh, well, was just, well, just for the record, as a, as, a, as a single bachelor, I'm trying to eat, run the meeting, take care of do dogs. I'm doing a fantastic job, but yes, council member Peck, go My ahead. heart goes out to you, Brian. <laughs> um, I would like to pull eight C. We'll go ahead and if you don't mind, we'll just treat the motion as being everything but 8C. So 
The motion is pass the consent agenda, except for 8C. It's been seconded by somebody female. I didn't see that. Count All right, it's been it was seconded by Council Member Christensen. Let's go ahead and vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, the motion carries. Let's go ahead and go on to uh, readings or uh, ordinances on second reading. So again, for any public wishing to speak on a public hearing item, please call in now. We're gonna go ahead and throw that information up on the screen. Um, and uh, Petey, sorry, we got dogs in city council chamber. That, that or else I'm, I'm, I'm killing small children. But uh, they're really excited about something. Anyway, so ordinance 2020-25 uh, or 9A on the agenda. The bill for an ordinance making additional appropriations for expenses and liabilities the city of Longmont for fiscal year beginning January 1, 2020. Um, does anyone have any uh, comments? And I cannot see everybody, but let's go ahead and have discussion if there is any. Can you take the number down just for a second so I can see my fellow council members? Actually, just uh, anybody have any comments? All right, let's go ahead and wait then. Uh, we're just going to take a two minute break, see if anybody pops in to have a public hearing. Considering I can only remember one person ever showing up and saying anything about the budget in nine years, I'm guessing nobody's going to call in, but let's give it time. And if everybody's curious, you're hearing a pit bull and a German shepherd, they look outside and every time a dog passes, they decide to uh, say hi. Then they all run together out in the backyard and make sure that they bark. So my neighbors love me. Mayor, that's been two minutes, and I do not see anyone in our waiting room. All right. Do we have a vote for a motion? I move ordinance 2020-25. Second. Second. All right. I made that motion, and uh, Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez seconded it. Um, all in favor, say aye. 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 Oh, say nay. All right. The motion carries unanimously. All right, let's go ahead and go on to the item removed from the consent agenda, 8C. Uh, Councilman Martin, I believe you took that off. Hey, I did, Mayor Beck. Mayor Beck. Oh, sorry, Councilman Beck. No problem. Actually, I just, I just pulled this for a comment. I know that we discussed this, um, I think it was before the pandemic earlier uh, in the year. Um, and because of the way the council call was written, I called Dan Wolford just to have a conversation about it because it did say that there would be the possibility of selling this uh, property. So for the people who were up on open space, knowing that we don't sell open space property, I, I wanted to say to the public that um, if we did, it would probably be sold to affordable housing. And uh, the, the homes, there are two homes, one on each lot that would be used for affordable housing in some capacity. So um, I just wanted to make that clear because I know there are a lot of people, environmentalists out there watching uh, our affordable housing and what we do with, uh, with that space. So with that, I am going to move 2020-52. I'll second it. Second. All right, it's been moved by Council Mayor Peck. I second it. Uh, there's no further discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. All right, item 8C, resolution 2020-52 passes unanimously. All right, let's move on to um, general business. Um, 
at this time, do we, I guess we, uh, do we need a motion? Yeah, I'll move that we recess the Longmont City Council and convene as the Board of Directors of the Longmont General Improvement District Number 1. Second. Uh, all right, it's been moved by myself, second by Councilmember Christensen. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. All right, it passes unanimously. Um, do we have a motion regarding resolution LGID 2020-02? Councilmember Martin, saving the day. <laughs> I move resolution LGA, LGID 22. Is that right? Second. All right, that was moved by Councilmember Martin. It was seconded by Dr. Waters. All in favor say aye. 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 All, aye. Opposed, all opposed say nay. All right, motion passes unanimously. At this time, I move that we adjourn as the Longmont General Improvement District Number One uh, Board of Directors and reconvene as the Longmont City Council. Second. Second. All right, I made it. Councilmember Christensen uh, seconded it, or I made the motion. Councilmember Christensen seconded it. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Say nay. All right, it carries uh, unanimously. All right, let's go ahead and go on to 11B. Um, a presentation from our cultural brokers. Update and presentation. I hope that's Carmen. I like Carmen. Hey, it's Carmen! It is Carmen. Yay! Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, thank you for um, bringing us in to do this presentation. Council Hidalgo Ferrin wanted to get an update on cultural brokers. Um, and so tonight what we're gonna do is just give you a quick highlight on our cultural broker network, the capacity that we built from uh, 2013 in regards to the flood to the COVID and how our cultural brokers really are important bridges and have been doing a lot of work. So Susan, I believe has got a PowerPoint for us. Um, and we're really just gonna go through this PowerPoint and talk about how we've been working collectively to make sure that we're including all community members. Uh, next slide, Susan. So first I wanna cover resiliency a little bit. And, and again, this is all woven together. Resiliency is our ability to anticipate risk, limit impact, and bounce forward rapidly by adapting and learning in the face of disruptive shocks and stressors. You can see where personal relationships, community-led action, acknowledging diversity as an asset, understanding why inequities exist and how to implement equitable solutions and developing strengthening partnerships is key to that bridge. And the difference between the flood and COVID is that we went into a virtual world. And I think as was mentioned earlier, many of our families and especially in our Latino community were not connected at that level. So this is a, a really a strong example of what it means to have cultural brokers that can reach out to people in different ways, especially when they're disconnected. Next slide, Susan. So cultural brokering, um, you've heard this term, you've seen that in our resiliency uh, for all assessment that we did. Um, and it's that act of bridging, linking, or mediating between groups of persons of different cultural backgrounds for the purpose of reducing conflict or producing change. And you can imagine that during a crisis, um, there's a lot of anxiety and a lot of uncertainty, and that can quickly evolve into conflict. We've been lucky that our cultural brokers are community partners from a formal to an informal. Um, we've built some capacity since 2013 to the present around formalizing a, a circle, which is called Boulder County SUMA. Uh, and we've got cultural brokers that are in a variety of sectors of our community and institutions. But I wanna make the point that cultural brokers are not just tied to race and ethnicity. Um, if you think of cultural brokers, and sometimes it's layered, I'll use Veronica Garcia as an example. Veronica Garcia works at the senior center. So she's a cultural broker with seniors, and then you layer that. Another skill is that she's a cultural broker with our Latino seniors. Um, think of folks that work with the disabled community or the GLBTQ communities. So cultural brokers are not just solely tied to uh, race and ethnicity. Next slide, Susan. Um, and I think that what's really important is that cultural brokers are really that bridge that can help with equity and it's that foundation to our work. Um, so quickly, equity is a system of fairness that includes full and equal access to opportunities, powers and resources so that all people achieve their full potential and thrive. It's embedded as an organizational and community value. 
We must understand and see all our community members as assets, not with a deficit lens, and a key to equity and key to equity as a whole community. Understand who's most negatively affected by inequities and why. Understand the historical and systematic systematic inequities that cause racial and social disparities. Um, so that's been really important to the key work of cultural brokers because we're embedded in different layers of the community. We understand and see uh, community members more from an asset base. And it was interesting that in the COVID report, we talked about resiliency and maybe there's a resiliency amongst the Latino community. So next slide, Susan. In uh, 2017, so after the flood, the state asked for us to do an assessment of resiliency. In 2017, the Resiliency for All assessment identified five barriers. Resource information, discrimination and fear, language, communications, cultural sensitivity, outreach, engagement, and education. So again, once again, those culture brokers are key, whether they're formal or informal. Um, and then it's important to understand that as we started talking about cultural brokers and valuing cultural brokers, we were able to formalize that network of support, not only for cultural brokers, but for the community. Susan, next slide. So where are we at now? Boulder County Cultural Broker Network. So we built capacity, um, not only from the Resiliency for All, but we also did a study with the Knight Foundation for over a year. Uh, on cultural brokers and what does cultural brokers mean within the Latino community. That led us to developing uh, the mosaic report with Boulder County and also developing Boulder County SUMA. Um, and then what we did with formalizing this network, we had just had our first uh, formalized training of cultural brokers, teaching them about institutions, how to navigate systems, understanding inequities. So that had just happened before COVID hit. COVID hits and quickly this group of folks says, we know our community is not as connected and there are many reasons at, like the barriers that you saw earlier, um, access to information, uh, whether that's digital or not being connected. Um, and so what happened quickly is that through that network of formal and informal leaders, we uh, identified three projects to take on. One was to develop and maintain a list of culturally competent resources for Boulder County uh, Latinos and also our undocumented community. So we compiled a list of over 200 resources and then provided an orientation to all of our cultural brokers. I sat in on a orientation with about 60 cultural brokers throughout Boulder County, explaining to them uh, what these resources were, where they're at, what their clients need to do or their community members need to do to navigate and access successfully to these systems. The next one was developing accessible Spanish content. So it's not just the literal translation, does the message make sense? So initially when you saw social distancing and you saw these ads that had maybe skis between two people, well, I don't ski. And a lot of other people maybe don't ski, so it quite didn't make sense. So how do we make messaging around precautions and safety and access culturally relevant? And so we took that on also. These were some of them were volunteered, some were folks that were paid within their institutions. The third one that I'm very proud of is that we convened funders, family resource centers, and Latino organizations to establish a fund for Latino immigrants that did not qualify for the federal funding stimulus. We assisted over 60 families within Boulder County, um, giving them a small stimulus. So that meant fundraising, that mean a process of communication, a process of ask, uh, assessing who needed help the most, and then distributing that uh, funds to those families. So that was uh, in Longmont, we had about 30 families that were assisted and then others in Lafayette and City of Boulder also. Next slide, Susan. Um, I wanted to take a little bit of time just to review some of our equity efforts that we've done. Um, and if you think about uh, community and neighborhood resources used to be separated, there was community relations. So community relations in 1980 was the first ombudsman 
between the police department and the Latino community. So in a way, we've served as that cultural broker for quite some time. And then the city has a lengthy history of our commitment to equity and diversity efforts, again, since 1980. In 2019, a group of team members, including leadership and staff, participated in the Urban Sustainability Equity Foundation training. And then we formed the city equity team, which I think was also very timely, not only to COVID and to have that equity lens in the forefront as we're moving through and identifying how to help our community, but also given the recent um, situations in regards to the killing of George Floyd and protests in our community. But I think more importantly is that we, we as an organization, the city of Longmont has used and worked with cultural brokers. There's a, a small film called Resiliencia para Todos and you'll hear Harold say, bring your cultural brokers in, work with your cultural brokers. And that has helped us, whether that's been through Envision, whether that's been focused on Longmont, whether that's been SAM, is to bring in the cultural brokers that are in the front line dealing with inequities and working on equity so that we can bring the community's voice. Uh, one of the last ones that we did also was the early childhood education. And I got to facilitate a, um, a focus group with the Spanish speaking in-home daycare providers. Um, those are the, not just the skills, but the opportunities to truly bring people forward and connect them. And Susan, I think that's the last slide for me. So I know I went through that very quickly. Um, and if anybody has any questions or thoughts, I'd be glad to help. Council Peck, Council. Yep, hold on, just getting there. Councilmember Peck. <laughs> thank you, Carmen. Thank you for that. Um, I'm going to be a little. Uh, can we have an honest conversation about this? Um, I know that you say you're cultural brokers for everyone, but your whole presentation was about the Latino community, yes. as as a uh, council member at large, I am concerned about all of the different cultures in our, uh, in our city. We, do you have a cultural broker for the, for the black, for our black residents? Because everything that you've said is specifically Spanish, Latinx, uh, I just missed the word. Um, it's all about those cultural brokers. So I would like to see cultural brokers for our Asian community, for our black community, for, um, to, to help them understand where they belong within the city. How are they able to get equity, et cetera? So where are we going with this? So currently, if you look at the history of the Longmont Multicultural Action Committee that started as a Latino strategic plan, evolved into the Multicultural Action Committee. And if you look during the, the outreach on the census, I developed a flyer in Chinese, uh, which I had to get Rita Liu's help to make sure that I was using the correct text so that we could distribute. We do have hey. folks like Rita Liu, Glenda Robinson, Madeline Woodley, who have been um, our supporters and connecting us to Dr. King events. It's not just about the celebration, they have done a lot of education, but they also are part of that weaving of problem solving. So it is not unusual that I will get a call from Betty Nunley who says we're experiencing a dis uh, discrimination or there seems to be a fair housing issue. And the same happens within the Asian community uh, we have a large Hindu community. Yes, we do. Folks that contact us and contact us on that. Do we have room for, to do better? Do we need to invest more? Um, I would say yes. Uh, and I'm glad you mentioned that because the people who are watching who happen to be part of those diverse cultural uh, groups, they need to know that they are also part of these cultural brokers. And when, when the whole thing is just given about Latino and not that I think that that's not important, of course it is, but we need to make sure that all of these people and where they can go, who their cultural brokers are, uh, who they can contact, people of their own culture, just like the Hispanic community has you and um, many and Marta Moreno and uh, 
all kinds of different organizations that are Spanish. We need to market and share about all the other incredible ethnicities and groups that we have and where can they go to have somebody to advocate for them who is of their culture and understands that culture. So that's what I would like to see, a broader spectrum that includes everybody in this city who is diverse. So thank you. You're welcome. Councilmember Hidalgo Faring. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and thank you very much for this presentation. Um, I think it's really important to get this work out um, into the public. Uh, I think that with any strong institution or organization, um, it is only made better when equity is at the heart of the conversation in setting policy and, um, and determining um, um, practices um, for the com for the community. So I saw on the slide the city equity team. Is that mm -hmm. comprised of different individuals from the cultural broker team, or um, were they trained under, or do they work in conjunction with each other? Just tell me more about that. So the city equity team and Harold actually might want to uh, talk a little bit about that. So all of the leadership team went through that folks from different uh, departments and divisions. Some are culture brokers in different ways. Um, as Councilwoman Peck just mentioned, uh, Wayne Tomek, who's our neighborhood resource person, is a cultural broker to neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have a variety. But Harold, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit more about the equity and where we landed right before COVID? <laughs> yeah, so we, um, when did we start this? We started this late in 2019, Carmen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so several staff members brought this program to my attention about really how do we go through an equity training program? And when we started the conversation, I think it was literally about my leadership team and how do we bring this to the, to the organization? Um, something that I like to do, generally is not just limited to my leadership team. Um, I want to bring in a diverse group of individuals from throughout the organization at different, different levels, different departments, so that we, we can have um, a more robust conversation because I think that helps us shift the needle a little bit more. Um, and so we brought in my leadership team, which is the folks that generally report directly to me or one of the ACMs. Um, and then we brought in this other group and we went through the six part series um, from um, what is it the urban Urban sustainability directors network. Yeah, so that group um, <laughs> and uh, we went through We went through that process and I think as we were all going through it, you know, one of the things um, That we all said is man, we're learning a lot um, and we're learning, you know, how we need to rethink what we do and how we look at things um, and it really evolved to the point of saying we need to take this and we need to really work on bringing it out into the entire organization. Um, um, and it was really it was really an interesting conversation to, to council member X point in the question it, it, it wasn't just limited to um, race and ethnicity. You know, while those were things that were talked about in this, um, what we saw is the conversation shifting to the um, LGBTQ population and how we look at, at, you know, how we could potentially react to things there. It talked about um, gender. I mean, and we all started bringing in more than just any one component so we could take a holistic look. And that's when we then said, okay, we want people who were part of this first training to come together and, and form the equity team and then really look at how we can build a broader curriculum that we can then start including in our CLUE program, um, which is the City of Longmont University, which is a broader training program that we provide to the entire organization and start having these conversations internally because we felt it was really important um, that we work on ourselves and, and really uh, make sure we understand and we're living it before we start moving into other directions. And, and so we started that process and they were meeting and um, got slowed down a little bit because of COVID. But what's interesting is we also have the employee advisory group 
Um, and that is a group that I work with on any number of issues. And before COVID, we came in and said, would you be interested in going through this program? Because once again, it's a really diverse group from throughout the organization. Um, and I think they said yes, and, and then our world changed. But what's interesting is um, they are now trying to, score, to schedule a joint meeting with the employee advisory group and our equity team so we can talk about issues that we're dealing with as an organization as a result of the world that we're in today. And, and so those are the things that we're trying to do to really continue taking this and pushing it out throughout the organization. Um, and what I will say unequivocally is um, I will tell you as we were going through um, the COVID response, as we're talking about budget issues, um, anything that's part of our conversation these days, I have yet to be in a conversation where somebody doesn't bring that up as something that we have to have as part of our conversation. You'll hear me say this a lot. Are we perfect? No. Do we forget about things at time? Yes. But the good thing is, is people are comfortable in saying, let's not forget this. And, and then we have to make sure that, that we, we, bring, we bring that, that that's included at the you know, forefront of the conversation. Um, I've had a conversation recently um, regarding some of our grant processes that we went through and how we look at that and had a really good um, conversation with um, outside partners on that. Um, and it, it really is about the entire community and looking at every aspect of our community and keeping equity as a fundamental lens. And so I don't know if that's what you wanted to, me to talk about, Carmen, um, but uh, it's an important part of what we do on a daily basis and where we wanna be as an organization. So um, thank you, that, that did help and clarify. So I remember back at our retreat, so this was pre-COVID, when I had talked about the idea. So we have the LMAC, and so when we look at cultural, as a, um, cultural diversity as a whole, uh, you know, in several, several of the presentations that I had done, I did like an iceberg. So I, I, I've done an iceberg. There's the part that you can see, which would be the traditions, the food, um, things at very surface level and, and celebration of, of different languages, diversity, that piece. But then there's a whole underlining, the part we don't see. And that's you know, our, uh, an individual's concept of justice, what they deem to be right or wrong or how they view that, how they interact with law enforcement, how they interact with the teachers and other authority figures. And, and this is really where the work of um, equity and policy take place is when we're looking below the surface level of cultural diversity. And so the purpose of wanting to bring forward some kind of uh, human relations commission or an equity council would be, you know, to have, and I, I think this would be a way to kind of combine the two efforts of looking at people who have been trained um, as cultural brokers from different um, parts of the community. So when I served on the CEA, the Cal Colorado Education Association equity team, we were one, I was one of seven educators throughout the state of Colorado. Um, so, and we, and we had all the races, um, we had a black member, a Hispanic, you know, of all the different um, Asian Pacific Islander. So we had all the different representation there. And that's where we looked at our organization's policies and practices, made recommendations. So really we need to have it, we would, if we really want to address equity and, and look at the inequities, and I think COVID really brought that out, especially in the school district. When I only had three kids of all my class who had internet connection, and I'm scrambling, working, and same thing with several buildings in our, in our district, trying to get them hooked up to internet, trying to make sure they had a device, knowing, knowing how to access those resources. Because another piece is, and I have a slide of that in my presentation where I have a, an individual trying to look over a fence and they're standing on a pile of ladders. So this was a little different. So you can give an individual all kinds of resources, but if they don't know how to access them appropriately, adequately, it doesn't matter. So it was, so a lot of my online learning experiences, I take my mask and I'd go sit outside their apartment, outside their window or on their porch and 
walk them through. This is how you get on. And I'm talking to parents through the windows, trying to get them so they wouldn't get left behind. And there's got to be a better way. <laughs> and so let's start looking at our policy and practices and, and implicit bias, the assumption. Uh, one of the things that I talked to several colleagues about is they said, well, you know, the kids secondary, they all have iPads. Well, if they don't have internet at home, they're not accessing those resources at home because they don't have the internet to use it. So I think if COVID taught us anything, it taught us the flaws and inequities in our system that we can work on to become better in our, within our community and strengthen our organization as a whole. Um, so, you know, I would kind of like to pursue that a little, a little more and see how we can have, because I think there is a place for LMAC but if we can have another committee that really focuses on our policy and practices and work with um, our organization on implicit bias and what that looks like. I mean, I think I still go to implicit bias training and I still check my, my biases, even though I train on this topic because we all have biases. Something that really concerns me is when people say, oh, well, I took a training, I don't have implicit bias. That's the most concerning to me when I hear that comment. So I, I think it's really important that we continue in this work and bring this forward and, and work to connect and engage our community to be a part of this effort. Uh, and that's, so thank you very much for putting this together. I really appreciate it. And thank you for actually asking Councilman Riago Faring. Uh, uh, Dr. Waters. Thanks Mayor Bagley. Um, Carmen, could go to page six on your, on the presentation, yeah, it's the definition of equity. Mm -hmm. um, is that for you? Is that the necessary and sufficient? What's what we see there? Both both necessary and sufficient. It's robust enough. It's clear enough. And I'm not trying to. This is not a test. I'm just I'm <laughs> at that. And I it's a question for me as I look at it. And I'm it's just and maybe I'm just not reading it the way I way. It should be read. Um, as I look at it, it's everything that's there should be there. Uh, but I see a real focus on opportunity, uh, kind of on on inputs, uh, and maybe the maybe the words achieve their full potential and value is the is the acknowledgement of outcomes or results of having made commitments to equity. I just wanted to kind of test that against your reading of it. Because it seems to me that equity, and I and I think we're going to be in a serious, way more meaningful conversation about equity post pandemic than we've ever been and should be, right? So the question for me is, um, uh, I, I've never I've never thought equity being only access to opportunity. Some people, as 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 Council Member Hidalgo Faring just mentioned, some people know how to how to optimize access to opportunity or resources differently than others do to achieve preferred life outcomes, better health, uh, better economic uh, health, you know, better family outcomes, whatever, whatever the, whatever the measures are or the aspirations are. And um, so let me, I'll be quiet and ask just for you to kind of engage with me what you about this definition. And then I have a very specific application of the definition to our practices in Longmont that I want to ask for you to react to. So I would say that what we said, and um, Councilwoman Hidalgo Faring just mentioned policies and procedures. And so if you look at the slide that says a system of fairness that includes full and equal access. So how that plays out, not only from decision-making to policy and procedures has to be examined with uh, kind of each word. What does it mean to have full? What does it mean to have equal? access to opportunities, power, and resources. So it's not just opportunities, it's also that power, it's also resources. So that individuals can um, achieve their full potential as they would want, right? My full potential may be different than your full potential. Um, and for a variety, it's very layered. I wish it was simple. Um, but There's it nothing is simple about this, I understand. Yeah, no, it is layered throughout that. And if we think about policy and procedure and how that plays out in delivery of service and goals, um, 
you know, that's where it not only gets complicated, but it provides us the opportunity to have a, a, a consciousness of equity that flows from the top to the bottom, from the bottom to the top. So let's drill down on one, one of our practices. Um, we, several of us had a chance just recently to uh, get a, uh, a reorientation to our uh, priority-based budgeting process and the criteria that we use and how we score proposals. Uh, this is my third time through the budgeting process. So I've seen that criteria twice. And, I, and for the staff who are listening to this, I think it's a very sophisticated, thoughtful, well-developed approach. I'm not critical of approach. But it struck me in this orientation that we were going through on one of the crit scoring criteria in terms of rating from zero to four, right, on, on proposals. Uh, proposals that have a, an impact on 75% of our community are rated a four. Mm -hmm. If they have an impact on 50% of our, of our population to 74%, they're rated a three. If they have an impact on, I think it was 15 or 25 to 50%, it got a two and less than zero to 25% got a one, right? Uh, and I looked at that and it, and it struck me that a whole lot of proposals might have uh, a zero to 25% impact on the general population, but a 75% impact or an impact on 75% of a targeted population. One of the populations for which we, we have cultural brokers among the, the subsets of our whole population that we've heard about tonight. And I, and I, you know, and I hadn't thought about it until this new energy and attention to equity that we have baked into our scoring of budget proposals, a way to evaluate them that, that did, does not reflect this conversation about equity. And I don't mean that to be a harsh criticism. I just think that, you know, we get there and maybe I don't understand the criteria. That's why I'm, it, by the way, it does relate to a comment. You know, one of the last comments you made was, we have to be thoughtful about how we invest, right? And the only way we invest is through our, not the only way, financially is through our budget, right? We invest in other ways. We invest energy and attention and political capital and those kinds of things. But in terms of hard cash, it's through, it's through how we uh, set priorities for our budget. Um, but it, that, that, stand, that, that exists for me as an example. And I could, be, I could be educated as to why I shouldn't think of it this way or see it that way. Uh, it just struck me that that's a, that could be uh, a way to score proposals that can contribute to, to inequity, in, in, even in the context of the conversation about equity. You, I, don't, I don't mean to put you on the spot. So I'll just say, um, and then I'm going to let Harold jump in, because I think that when we talk about budgets, um, and a lot of folks who have been through other recessions know that um, what will happen, the first thing to go is diversity, inclusion, training, right, assessments, um, because it becomes very budgetary. And so the determinants of equity to be embedded in a budget would take some work. And I just sent Harold and Sandy um, a PowerPoint presentation on how to embed equity into the PBB. So kindly, they got it. So I'm not sure <laughs> if Harold has had time to really look at it. I will say that one of the things that we are now a member of GEAR, which is the Government Advancing Racial Equity, and they provide us a lot of tools. If you remember when we did the retreat, we had a checklist on decision-making and how you look at decision-making and embed equity. Um, so as Harold has said, we're, we're not perfect, but I think we're at an opportune time to really look at those equity opportunities and begin to implement those. Do that assessment and implement. What is considered essential uh, for one segment of the community may be non-essential viewed for the larger community. The whole idea of uh, schools are not resourced the same, right? Um, and should some schools have additional resources given again the determinants of equity, right? Um, so, Harold, I don't know if you've had a chance to. Well, the answer to that question is yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the answer is yes. And I think to, to go back into that, um, and I've had this conversation with some of you, um, as we've moved through it, that's why we wanted our leadership team to go through this and we wanted others 
um, to bring equity to the forefront of the conversation. Um, you know, we've been in PVB, um, and you know, there's some other modules, but that's what we now need to build into the process um, as we're moving forward so that it, it is more front and center when we're evaluating that. Why well, I will tell you why I wanted, why I agreed to say we needed to move forward with this training um, is if you don't have it in the systems, then you have to short circuit the systems where it becomes part of our conversations as we're looking at these things so we can build it into the system. And, and that is a lens to your point when we go through the budget process um, and we see the request, um, PBB is not the end all be all. Um, it is a tool um, that we can utilize in the budget process. Our equity training is another tool that we can utilize in the budget process um, until we can continue moving forward to include that to where it is part of um, how we evaluate it in, in the PVB world. And you know, my commitment is we're gonna get there um, when we do this. Um, Carmen won't let me get away from not getting there. Um, but the reality is, is we're gonna get there. And, and those are the questions, at least when we go in, when we go into budget reviews, those are things um, that we look at. Um, you all have asked about, you know, how is early childhood education going to fare when we're in this, the financial constraints that we're in. Um, and for everything that Carmen just talked about that, well, it may not necessarily, and it's actually probably gonna score high because of other things, but let's say it didn't score high and it was in a level four, just because it's in a level four doesn't mean that that's gonna be a recommendation that I'm necessarily going to bring to you all in a budget because you have to look at other things. And you have to look at what's the impact to the community, what's the impact to different segments of the community. And, and I could argue just on that one piece that it's going to impact the economics in our community in many ways. Um, it does no good if we can't have early childhood care providers not functioning because that prevents people from going to work. And, and so those are the conversations that I, that I have and I need to be held to when we're going to the budget and bringing recommendations to you all. And frankly, you need to hold me accountable for that as we're bringing recommendations to you and we're looking at those issues. Um, but it goes deeper than even that, to be honest. It goes in, we approve a budget for new parks. Are we equitably distributing new parks across the community? We give a budget where it's a number for road, street reconstruction. I mean, are we equitably distributing that throughout the community? Obviously, the condition of the streets and other things come into play, but you know, I will tell you when you look at some of the stuff that Garrett is talking about and what we're learning about other communities, you can barely, very clearly in other places see where funds are unequitably distributed throughout a community. Um, and, and that's even a layer beyond PVB where we have to be cognizant as an organization um, in terms of this. It's, you know, are we putting the resources in to, and, and there's some programs that I have to look at in terms of um, carryover funds that we have that we were holding, but are we putting the resources that we need to into NGLA so we can engage with a broader set of communities within our community and take it to a next, another level? Those are things that we have to, and we're obligated to look at for all sectors of our community um, that are even go into much more detail than PBB. So I gave you a really long answer to your question, but the answer is we need to include it. And we need to find a way to include it, but not just at that level. I mean, it's got to go into our base evaluation when, when what we're looking at on a daily basis. Well, I appreciate the attention you that you're bringing to the budgeting process because that's what plays out in really tangible ways. Right. Oscar Christensen. Marcia, you're next, I promise. Okay, I'll try to be brief. It's the end of the night. But um, another meaning of equity is building a share for yourself, building wealth from generation to generation. And um, that's really important for us to be thinking of. We do, Kathy Fedler and um, our 
affordable housing fund does do a lot of counseling because if generation after generation people have been denied the ability to build any wealth to hand over to their children the average black household has a net wealth worth of seventeen thousand dollars the average white household has a net worth of one hundred and seventy one thousand that's a huge gap and it goes on and on and it gets worse and worse and it's because for generate and it's with many many different communities for generations we've had the banking the real estate the development community deny redline people and deny them the ability to buy homes that they could have that they could have bought but they were denied the right to even take out a loan based upon their uh, cultural group their race or their gender and so that's another form of equity that we we do do in this city we try to counsel people I know there are other terrific programs like PI where um, there's one I know just uh, exclusively, I think for Latinos, that um, if you save some money, they put some money in and they, they uh, mentor you all along. That's a terrific program because it's one thing to be treated fairly, but People, people are tough and they get by, but once you cannot even get a foot in the door because you are systematically denied the right to get a foot in the door, to have any stake in your own life financially and to hand anything down to your kids, then, then you despair. You know, I think this is huge in this country right now. People are in despair because they see this generation after generation, people are murdered in the street, people are denied any kind of housing, they can't, they can't move anywhere. They can't get a stake in their own lives. And so equity goes beyond um, just talking about and making sure people have equal opportunities for being treated fairly, which of course, everyone has a right to do. Uh, everyone should be treated with respect. Um, but I, I want us to also think about how systemic the denial of people having a, a way to raise wealth and a stake in their own life. Thomas Paine, in, uh, when he was writing about, I mean, believe it was in Common Sense, proposed that every child in America get a stake that would be kind of the equivalent of about $20,000 now, so that they could buy a home or they could start a business. You know, we, we've been talking about this for centuries, yet we don't have it. And we have very, very different um, uh, opportunities for everyone. We've all seen that thing where, you know, put one, go one step forward if you have a father and a mother Go another step forward if you live in a house that you own. Go another step, and this is the way it builds up until you have all the people who are left behind and all the people who are half a mile ahead of them. That's partly due to wealth and wealth inequity. So, but I thank you for what you're doing, Carmen. And I, it's really valuable to have us attack this, these problems that are, have, are just entrenched in America, gnaw away at them from all kinds of different directions. That's what it's gonna take. Uh, Marsha Martin. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. Um, this is just a, a suggestion that I have been thinking about because of the strange times that we're living in, Carmen. And I thought that your um, the way you weighted the services um, that you're, you're putting together and the weighting of your examples, for example, was, <laughs> was, uh, was really appropriate. I mean, it, 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 it was a profile of Longmont, except that um, I've been thinking about emergencies and Longmont has a significant number of people, if you gather them all together, that are sort of, of micro minorities. In, in my neighborhood, there's one family 
that has one English speaker and the rest of the family speaks Hungarian, I think, maybe, or let's call it Hungarian. I don't, I'm sorry, guys. I, <laughs> I, I don't know because I only talk to granddad, okay? Um, but um, when we have, uh, I, I was talking to uh, Marta Lochamin, actually, who was t telling me about the work she did post-flood uh, in terms of getting the monolingual Spanish people, speakers to, um, to talk about the access problems that they had during the flood. You know, well, during the flood, it, and it took two years afterwards to, to get it together to figure out what kind of emergency procedures were missing for people who couldn't talk to anybody. Um, and I have been thinking about, you know, we, we now have, have health emergencies that are happening. And it made me think about the teletranslation services that hospitals have, so mm -hmm. that if there's somebody that can't talk to anybody in the whole hospital, they can find a translator on the phone. Um, and I wonder if part of the city's equity repertory um, shouldn't be some kind of a, of a widespread connectivity resource for those people in micro emergencies. So, you know, like the family at the other end of my street, if it was grandpa who got sick and he's the only English speaker, then how does anybody who's not in the hospital in isolation access any services? Um, and I know that can't be your top priority right now ex until maybe it is because all of a sudden there's a family that can't talk to anybody and they can't go into the hospital and use that translation service. Oh so. Yeah, I'm just wondering if it could be added to the list. So, so we we do have language line, um, which is the same telepiece, and they also now have video services um, to at least to get at that. I think to answer that question is it's also and Carmen can jump in after this. Um, it, it's also understanding what's in the community and, and where we need to be more robust to the broader again, to point you all made, how are we making our services more accessible and ro more robust to, to get at some of those issues that you just brought up? But on the interim, we do have something where if we needed it, we could do it, I think, is how do we more widely integrate it with what we do on a daily basis? Well, really, and just having people, um, having the helpers know about it, right. you know, because I, I wouldn't have known to ask. Right. So that's a kind of a load off my mind because I live in that kind of a neighborhood. But, but yeah, I'm glad. I'm I'm really um, happy to know that that's there. That's a great start. So I'll I'll just add that all of our work around being able to be uh, have a strong foundation to be bilingual bicultural is to enable us to move to being multilingual and multicultural. Um, one of the things that we assessed after the flood was that there was an emergency preparedness guide in only one language, English. New York has emergency preparedness guides in 27 languages. We now have it in two languages. Uh, when we went to out to the community, um, I was approached by folks in the mountain community, in the Nepalese community. And what we did is we used some of those lessons learned and we began to work to empower so that they had a seat at the table and they also had a voice. And within those communities, we've identified uh, different folks that are leaders within those communities so that we can begin to really equitably build our capacity to be a multilingual, multicultural community. Um, and I know we've mentioned LMAC as kind of the, the top of the iceberg in the celebrations. But along those lines, we have done some things like immigrant integration dialogues. We have done SAM, and it might seem like the larger community is the Latino community, but it is never um, without uh, providing a seat at the table for other communities that might even be a smaller minority. 
Um, so as you know, one of the things that I was able to work on is to work with the Native American community. And I've worked with the Native American community for many, many years on different issues of inequities. Um, and I am not a tribal member, um, but because of this position, it allows us and it pushes us um, to be cross-cultural, uh, to be that bridge that is accessible, but is also working to empower people so that they can take that seat at the table, they can have their voice. and. Uh, Hopefully that's where we're going. We we can only do better, uh, right, Harold? <laughs> exactly. Thank you, Carmen. Councilmember Peck. Carmen, thank you very much for for just stating this. That that was my point about when we're talking about cultural brokers for Longmont. That. I wanted your information about what are we, do, where do we go for all these cultures and what, and we are working with all the cultures so that that is what our residents are hearing, that they're all included in what we're doing for each one. So thank you very much. I'm glad this conversation brought us to that point. All right, I just wanna also say, Carmen, you guys do great work. Um, uh, without the cultural bro brokers and our um, ombudsman, so to speak, it, it just, you guys do great. So um, I've seen you in action on all kinds of things and uh, we're lucky to have you. Thank you very much. So anything else? Uh, Council member Dago Faring. So, um, so when you reference SAM, could you say what the acronym stands for? Let me see if I get this right, because Karen's listening. Uh, supporting Action for Mental Health? Yes, yes. <laughs> I knew <laughs> that, but uh, our public probably doesn't know that. Yes. Uh, I'll then let you know outreach for that when yes. it's in infancy stages. So yes, I wanted to make sure people knew. Thank well, you. And, so, and so everyone knows when we were, when we went to the All-American City work, that was one of the programs we profiled. Mm -hmm. um, in, in terms of that activity and we were recognized for is, is really taking it into other communities. And just so you all know, um, it, this is obviously um, important to all of us. Um, but, you know, I want to personally thank Carmen because Carmen knows that, and everybody knows that if Carmen needs me, <laughs> Carmen calls me and we're having a conversation. But what I want to really thank Carmen for and her whole team, Carmen, Susan, Wayne, um, the rest of the cultural brokers is they also let me use them as a soundboard as I'm thinking through things. And I did that the other day. I, I sent an email out and I called Carmen and said, did I get this right? I mean, was I conveying the message that I needed to convey? And I think having the ability to have that candid conversation and where um, she can be directly honest with me and anyone else is important to an organization as you're taking steps in terms of social equity and, and moving forward. And, and to know, um, to your point about implicit biases, we have them. I've been through training. I need more training um, because it never goes away. Um, but giving people the ability to say it's okay to call me on that is an important first step. Thank you, Carmen. Right. You're awesome. All right, just uh, um, I saw a hand clapping, so that's good. Um, all right, let's go on to last but not least. Uh, I got a phone call from Councilmember Peck a few weeks ago, and her concern was downtown businesses, and uh, she threw out the idea that maybe we set aside council contingency funds to maybe give away some gift cards and whatnot to uh, Longmont families, not all of them, of course, but first come, first serve, um, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 bucks or so, that they would then be allowed to uh, take to the restaurants uh, to generate, you know, just some local downtown traffic. That is what 11C is on the, doing on the, the agenda. Councilmember Peck, do you wanna, you wanna mention some things there? I do, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you, Mayor Bagley, for putting this on the agenda. I made, I meant to make a motion last week and totally forgot. Um, but, but we, you and I had discussed uh, $10,000 rather than 
five, which would give 250 vouchers or credits, credit cards or whatever you want to call it, to be given out to the public to use in Longmont restaurants. Um, I personally don't care what part of the city they take them to. Downtown's great, but we have incredible restaurants. Uh, Rosario's is, is a wonderful restaurant. Um, and it's not downtown. So um, the reason I, I thought about this is that we do need to help our businesses, but we also need to open up to the public and let them know that council supports them going to our local businesses. Rather than giving the money to giving any money to the business, I would rather have the residents actually spend the money in the restaurant of their choice. Um, I don't think that that's too much money actually to give it, it also tells our residents that we understand where they are how hard this has been and that we would like to support both them and the restaurants so i don't i don't know how it would be run if it would be um people would would maybe through the chamber maybe through ldda but i would let uh i i hate to put any more work on the staff um, but that is just uh, my thought on how we can be more open to the public, let them know we care, and that we really want our restaurants specifically to open up and, and that we all support each other. So that was my thought. So did you make a motion? But, uh, you know, I am... I would like to clarify with you first, Mayor Bagley, that we had talked about ten thousand dollars, and it does say five thousand in the. Uh... We can. I. I. I to be honest, I don't remember uh, ten thousand. Okay. I. I probably told Harold five thousand, and just figured we could change it. But uh, if we did, I mean, even with. It would be two hundred and fifty with ten, with ten thousand. Yeah. The. Um... Each, fa each family would get 20 at five or 40 at 10, or so if we had 10,000 divided by 250, that's $40 each for 40 families. Um, is that too much, too little? Anybody have any thoughts? Why, why don't you make a motion, Joan? And then just make a motion. I'll second whatever you say, then let's go ahead and. Okay, I move that we. Uh... Authorize council to take $10,000 of out of the, I mean, authorize staff to take $10,000 out of the council contingency fund um, for vouchers to our residents to support uh, Longmont restaurants. I'll second that. All right, let's just talk about it quick. Councilmember Mayor Christensen. Actually, you know what? I'm sorry. Let's do it with Mayor Pro Tem. He hasn't said anything today. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. Uh, I do agree with Councilmember Peck that this should be open to any locally owned or operated restaurant, not just within the downtown district. And I think that probably the easiest way, I don't know if it's the easiest way for them necessarily, but I think they have some the resources to, to at least help facilitate it would be the Chamber of Commerce. Um, and so maybe some sort of partnership there as far as, I, I don't think $10,000 is, is too much in this case, considering how much money is still left over in the contingency fund. And so uh, with those those thoughts in mind, I will be supportive. Councilmember Christensen. Um, I'm very supportive of this. I, um, I do think that as Councilman um, uh, Rodriguez said, this needs to be locally owned restaurants because chain stores do have a lot more uh, wiggle room, even though some of them are also, of course, hurting. But um, we're, we're just, all we can do is long run. Um, I do think that it should be $25 that will induce people to come if you, and it will get it out to more people. And uh, so, you know, if I had $25 and the total bill was $40, I would be happy to pay that. It's, just, you know, it's not supposed to be like a free meal for everybody. It's supposed to be to help the businesses, not to necessarily help people who also, of course, need help too. 
Um, so I, I think it would should be sort of $25 and uh, 250 of them for $10,000. And um, the community foundation could also uh, oversee this. So that's my suggestion. All right, that would be $6,250, but I assume that you'd want, do you want $25 and more than 250 or do you want 250 and give them the full vouchers? You said 25. Well, $10,000 and uh, vouchers of $25. Okay. Right. Or any local restaurant, locally right. owned restaurant. Okay. And um, all right. Uh, Councilmember Martin, you want to say something? Yes, I did. Um, I just want to make sure I, I, I don't have any problem with uh, a stimulus for downtown. I, I feel like we, well, or, or a stimulus for Longmont, I, I have concern that, um, two concerns. One is, um, this would put the council contingency fund at $20,000. Um, I don't really have a, uh, an idea of what council contingency funds have been used for when it was really necessary to, you know, to scrape the barrel and, and put a patch on something that was really hurting. Um, maybe, maybe Harold um, can, Come up with a couple of incidents. If Jim's on the line, Jim or Teresa, they may have to help me. The one thing that the um, that I think we used it for during my tenure was um, emergency spraying because of West Nile. Um, we may have used it for some flood recovery work. You know, if I could just jump in. The, the 30,000 is what's from the original appropriation. The ordinance on first reading tonight, the carryover ordinance is bringing over the leftover balance from last year. So your concern about it being down to 20 is actually um, not the case. It's gonna be higher. I don't, I'm looking for it right That's what now. I was trying to find. I think we're adding 50 or 60,000 back in. So I think you're gonna have a significant in, amount in there anyhow. I don't know the answer to the question of, of what uses we've had, though. We'd have to check some records. Okay, so I remembered well, another. So you augmented um, a contract to Okomete with your um, council contingency. Um, I remember that one. Yeah. Uh, and and it, uh, Jim's right. I was worried that we were getting too too low for it to be effective if we had a serious problem that needed to be solved with that fund. Um, so if it's going back up, I'm much less uh, um, worried uh, about the balance remaining in the fund. I do have a little bit of worry about the distribution of of these vouchers or gift cards or whatever they are. Um, if the, especially if the Chamber of Commerce distributes them, are they gonna go to wealthy people? Are they gonna, you know, um, could, we, could we distribute them um, through, through Sandy's rebate program, for example? It seems like that'd be um, a, a much better way to, um, give families a boost and, and you know, do something memorable uh, for them. And the other thing that I would at least want to look at is, is can we all kind of take a survey and see who's doing their social distancing really well and use those restaurants? Because I don't want to put anybody in jeopardy. That's Rick Christensen. Um, so I can, because I've been on here a long time, like you, Brian, I've, I can tell you, we've, uh, we've helped um, El Comite out at least three times with contingency funds. We have helped out the um, Sister Cities program several times to help send kids to places. We have also uh, used that fund to uh, help uh, the program that we had, and I still hope we have with the Arapaho people. Um, 
uh, I think we used some during the flood because this is when, you know, this is what the, you have a contingency fund for. <laughs> it's an emergency. If this is not an emergency, I don't know what is. So, um, <clears throat> uh, yeah, I, I don't want to see all this go to people's wealthy buddies because that's not, that'll help the businesses, but it won't really help equally shared um, with people who could use, you would like to go out to dinner, but they can't really afford it. But if they had an extra $25, they could afford it. So, but uh, yeah, historically we have used those contingency funds for things that were kind of special projects that just, they're one off. They come up and uh, they seem like it's a worthy cause. It's our own little worthy cause fund from city council. All right, anybody else? All right, there's a motion on the table that we set aside $10,000 from the city council contingency fund for the city staff. Sorry, that's the dog thing that's going in the background. But $10,000 for uh, the council contingency fund for city staff to use for uh, restaurant vouchers throughout all of Longmont, not just downtown. Correct, John? Yeah. And then are we going to uh, accept, it sounded like Councilmember Christensen had an amendment uh, to basically say $25? I, I thought that was the original. Uh, okay, then, then the, the most. $25 each. Either, either way, we'll put the $10,000, $25 vouchers to be distributed mm -hmm. first come, first serve to people to use in restaurants. Councilmember Martin? Yeah, I don't think I would vote for it if it's a first come, first serve. Uh, distribution. I would much rather do something uh, that adds to the equity quotient, like distributing it through the rebate program. Uh, Councilman, Councilwoman Martin, would you like to make an amendment to the motion? Yes. Um, I propose that, uh, in addition to what Councilmember Peck proposed, that we um, have assistant city manager Sater uh, uh, come up with a good mechanism for distributing the, these through her rebate fund, like taking the bottom 250 families or you know the, something like that. Sandy's over there nodding. Thank you, Sandy. I didn't want to do something horrible to you. But it sounds like that's feasible. So that's my proposal. Will you accept that, Councilmember Peck? Yes, thank you. All right. Um, it's still seconded. Let's go ahead and vote on the motion. Harold, do you need clarification on this? Sorry, Harold. I think Aaron raised his hand. Uh, uh, all right. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. I just wanted to clarify that my uh, comment about the Chamber of Commerce was for facilitation with actually involving the businesses for the voucher or whatever, as they'll have the largest network for businesses to be involved with, not for the distribution. So just, just a clarification. Thank you. I think as long as we have the, as long as we have the leeway to work with partners that we need to, to facilitate it under the guidelines that you all have talked about, I think we're good. Don't forget the Latino chamber as well. Right. <laughs> Okay, I call the question. Ryan, you are, you're muted. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. All right, the motion carries unanimously. Good job, Council Member Peck. Ryan, uh, I yep. mean, Mayor Bagley, would you mind as a point of personal uh, uh, Just do it, say, say whatever yeah. you want, go ahead. Well, no, we're talking about the Council Contingency Fund and I did yeah. talk to Harold today and I think he talked to some others of you about um, some of our residents who are a bite behind on their city bills, utility bills, et cetera. And um, we were trying to figure out how, without turning off their uh, utilities, to get them to come to the table to make that good. They, they haven't been paying for three or four months on their bills. And how do we work that? So I put out the suggestion, and, and I would like you to think about it, this isn't a motion, that we make interest-free loans to 
some of the residents who have not been able to pay during this pandemic that from March through the end of June, that we give an interest-free loan that we pay uh, through the contingency fund, we pay those bills for them and they would have to pay us back. I, I don't think we should give this away or allow them to uh, continue to not pay their utility bills, but uh, it is just a thought on how we can move forward, help staff, uh, help the residents, let them know that we, we understand how horrible this is at this point in time, but we do need those utilities paid. We need the taxes on them. We need everything for our city to, to come back as well. We're a business. So um, I just want you to think about that. And, and I don't know what the total amount would be. And maybe Harold can do some research for us and see how many people we're talking about, um, what the total amount would be. And then uh, next week, maybe we can make a motion or at least put it on the agenda to discuss. Yeah, and if I can jump in a slight sure. um, adjustment to this too is um, also some other funding coming in from state and feds that we're trying to understand as well. Um, um, and, and so I think part of what we're, um, we're gonna look at some other options. So that's some other pieces that came into play too. Okay. So. It would basically be a bridge loan for uh, interest-free bridge loan uh, to, to the point that Councilwoman Martin was making is that this contingency fund is for emergencies and we are going to be uh, rebuilding for at least a year, if not two and longer. So anything that we can help, if we help residents, we help ourselves. We help the city as well. It's, uh, so I just, I'm just putting that out there, trying to help staff figure out how we're going to work through this. If we can get enough grants or federal funds or state funds, then we won't have to even think about another revenue source. But that is one that we as council can help with. So thank you for listening. All right. Uh, well, let's go on to final call public invited to be heard. Can we throw up the screen and wait two minutes? Yes, Mayor, one minute. Anybody? Yes, Mayor, we do have one. 
All right, let's go ahead and leave it open and then let's just start, okay? So let's go ahead, three minutes. State your name and address for the record, please. Hello, this is Ermine Nomir, 524 Flickr Avenue, 80501. Thank you so much for the opportunity to call in. I was kind of shocked that it worked and I'm excited. Um, but really the reason I am calling is I am representing a group or groups uh, throughout the county that have led a lot of demonstrations, a lot of marches and protests, no riots yet, that's fantastic. And I've heard a lot of conversation so far in terms of committees or groups that may be formed to get, I guess, to come together and start having some critical discussions that we may not have elevated before in the past. I'm wondering um, what the best way to work with this community, we had some great conversations with the chief of police, um, have connected with Haddad over at the school district, and are still looking to connect with a few other players as well as facilitators and, and the like. I'm wondering two things really, how do I get more engaged with what you guys have going on? How do I ensure that the voices that need to be heard, and I'm not talking from people with PhDs, but from us local everyday people are really the ones that are leading the discussion from youth um, and where it's a little bit more listening, a little bit less of here's what we think the answer or the solution is. And then lastly, um, well, actually, those are the two critical ones. That's it. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Are there, is there anybody else in the queue? No, Mayor. All right, that concludes. Uh, final call, public invited to be heard. Let's move on to Mayor and Council comments. Councilmember Martin. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. I am just uh, wanting to send a thank you to the Longmont Downtown Development Authority. Um, I think everyone knows that we have a number of groups now um, in a, uh, protesting the death of, of um, George Floyd and the epidemic of police brutality um, and inequitable application of the law in this country. Uh, and they're doing it at Sixth and Main, where uh, you know Longmont has been holding vigil for years now. Uh, about inequities of various sorts. And uh, a number of people who uh, have been out there have expressed some fear because in other places, in other contexts, uh, people who opposed uh, this particular cause uh, have been attacking by doing things like driving cars into the crowd. Um, I don't know if in Longmont those fears are likely to be realized, but you know we do get a lot of people rolling coal um, as they drive past that vigil, so maybe it's not very far-fetched after all. And um, the LDDA has uh, undertaken to put out a new big uh, concrete flower pot, a giant one that you couldn't drive through or around. Um, on the north side of the 6th and Main Plaza uh, so that uh, uh, where the people are standing uh, would not be as accessible to somebody who was trying to do, you know, vehicular terrorism. Uh, and I thought that was um, uh, very commendable that, that they would get, take a request like that and, and just say, sure, we can do that. And I hope they can get it in for this weekend, but I'm afraid it's going to take until next week um, to get it in place. So thank you, guys. All right, Councilmember Waters. Thanks, Mayor Ragley. Um, I just want to say that we have a chance to thank Carol uh, on a regular basis in our conversations with him and in these meetings. Uh, but there's a whole bunch of other staff members on this call and a couple of thousand others who aren't on this call. And um, 
uh, you know, everybody, it seems to me, who comes to work for the city does it for one reason and one reason only, and that is to serve in the areas in which they have particular expertise or interest. And I, I can't imagine a time, I mean, it's, it's never an easy duty. I can't imagine a more difficult or challenging time than right now. And, uh, and I don't know what kind of input or feedback the staff's getting. I can imagine the kind of feedback that our natural resources folks are getting, who are having to make hard decisions uh, that are going to inflame probably half the community. And they're going to make those decisions because they care deeply about health and safety. They're making decisions that nobody wants to make. They dedicate their lives to creating facilities that welcome the public. They joy, they, they take great joy in creating amenities that people flock to because they're so attractive and so much fun. And to have to take a position to say you can't or to put up fences or whatever is a, it, it's, it's, it's contrary to what they've created. And yet it's what they're called to do right now. So I can imagine what a whiplash experience it is. Uh, we're reading enough incoming emails on you know, all sides of an issue to know how harsh the feedback can be. But I just want to say to the staff, thanks. We need you now. We need your best. Your, we need you to rise to the challenge more than ever. And it's probably a time across the country, in every city in this country, where the call to duty is more discouraging now probably than it's been. I, I hope that's not true here. But I just want to say, uh, I, I admire the fact that you've all risen to the challenge. We need you to keep rising to the challenge. Uh, we've got, it's an A team that's out there every day. The more I interact with our city staff, the more impressed I am. And uh, I appreciate your work. I know the vast majority of the community does as well. And I want to say, you know, keep getting up and bringing your A game and know how much we appreciate it. Thanks. Councilman Martin, are, are you clapping or did you raise your hand? Okay. <laughs> Anybody else? All right, so sorry tonight if I'm grumpy. Dr. Waters, I want to apologize again. Didn't mean to get in a shot match with you. I didn't the, want to get in a shot match with you either. But really, really what it comes down to is I don't want to debate COVID-19 anymore. That's what it was, so I apologize. <laughs> okay. That's really what we I was can, saying. We, I just, we, I just, we, we it, can it, go it, debate it, that another yeah, time. Yeah, it, 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 yeah, it's serious. We'll take precautions, but we'll, we'll, I just didn't want to debate it anymore. Um, so, yeah, no, just uh, Harold, thanks for everything you do. Uh, if nobody else has anything for mayor and council comments, do you have anything? No, I just, uh, I want to, to thank the entire team, the, the thousands that we have. Um, you know, never before have they had the volume of things that they're dealing with, the challenges they're dealing with, um, dealing, you know, things that we never thought we would be engaged in. Um, for example, the housing authority. And, and I say this to them as much as I can, but on my Friday conversations, um, it's every person in the organization that is, inspires me to come in and, and do the best that I can because they're simply amazing. Um, and their hearts are in the right place and they want to do the best that they can for the community. Um, and the one thing I would say is it's a we, and it's a we as an organization, and it's a we as a community, and only together um, can we move through this and, and be patient with our folks because to the point that council member water said we don't want to close swim beaches we don't want to close bridges we don't want to do all of these things but at the end of the day what we're trying to do is make the best decision that we can for the health safety and welfare of this community um, and um, we don't enjoy it but just be patient with our folks because um, this this challenge is beyond what I would say now, anything that the flood presented it to us, um, and it's gonna be with us a lot longer. Their hearts are in the right place and they wanna do what's best for the community. Um, and I'm extremely fortunate to, to work with a team from top to bottom, left to right of the organization that inspires me daily. And I thank them for doing that. Um, and I thank you all for recognizing that. It's an amazing group here. No more comments. Eugene, I'm sorry, Mr. May. No comments, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. May. 
All right. Any, if nobody else has anything, uh, do we have a motion to adjourn? I will move that we adjourn. Second. Second. All right. It was seconded by Dr. Waters. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. All right. It's unanimous. All right. See you guys later. Bye. Good night.